All right, thanks for joining me today. We're gonna to talk about the anesthetic considerations for positioning in the operating room. Nagel Hout's the main textbook that we're using for this lecture. However, we've used other sources as well, some journal articles and even some other books like Miller and probably Morgan McHale, I can't remember exactly. You guys can read the objectives on your own. Positioning. So before we go into how we can screw this up in the operating room for patients, we should first start off with what's normal. Normally, there's some kyphosis in the thoracic area. Uh, there's some lordosis in the lumbar area. Uh, if you kind of look at the spine here, I think I've drawn this before, you can see in the middle what's normal. The spine's obviously just not a perfectly straight column. It has some curve to it. And so the curve is something you should take in consideration when you're padding people and you're positioning people, but it's also something you need to take in consideration when people have abnormal curvatures as they age, for instance, if they get more kyphotic in the thoracic area, or if they have accentuate lordosis in their lumbar area. And what can happen when we give these patients muscle relaxants and or we put them in, in very unusual positions that push them out of their normal alignment and stuff. What might be normal for the average person might not be normal for some patients. And in those cases, you have to take extra precautions in padding these patients and preparing them for surgery before they go to sleep. You ever had that tingling in your arm when you brushed up against something hard, woken up in the middle of the night and your arm's asleep? Perhaps you're sitting in an uncomfortable position right now and you keep repositioning. So your body, whether you're consciously doing or unconsciously is doing, it's always trying to move itself to reposition itself because obviously if you're in one position for too long, you can develop pressure ulcers, you can also hurt your nerves. We luckily in the unconscious and unconscious state will often reposition, right? In the middle of your sleep, you don't stay perfectly still the entire night. You most likely make subtle but shifts in your body weight in order to stay comfortable. We do this without waking up, for instance. Sometimes we wake up because our arms are asleep. Sometimes we uh, are consciously made aware of the tingling numbness in our legs from sitting on an uncomfortable stool for too long. Either way, our body makes an effort to fix the problem. In anesthesia, we blunt these responses. So we not only make people unconscious and unaware that their leg is asleep because the way we position it in the stirrups was incorrect, but we now withdraw also the ability of the body to say, ouch, that hurts and withdraw from that stimulus, withdraw from that pain because we've given them either so much anesthetics or we've muscle uh, relaxed them and they're no longer physically able to do anything in the unconscious state. Nerve anatomy gets a little confusing, but basically this picture is telling you that the vascular supply for nerves is encased within the bundles of nerve fibers. And there's no lymphatic system that's in here. So that if there's ever a lot of interstitial edema, there's nowhere for it to go. And you're gonna end up increasing the pressure within this in case epineurium. And as a result, that pressure is gonna prevent either blood flow going to the nerves or cause further congestion of blood flow leaving the nerves through the, through the, through the veins. And this can become an enormous problem for some patients from either direct trauma causing interstitial edema or from other issues such as uh, metabolic disorders or if you had something along the lines of a shear injury and localized inflammation that can further complicate the already damaged or uh, traumatically damaged um, nerves. So there's five categories on how nerves get damaged. And if you look at it from the categorical standpoint, or maybe after we look back on cases and we say, okay, well, what happened to this patient? Why do they have an ulnar uh, neuropathy or a sciatic neuropathy? We can say like, well, what caused it? Like what were some of the things we could have possibly avoided to avoid the nerve damage? So if we go back and we focus on these five things, preventatively, we can also hopefully reduce these outcomes in the surgical population by saying, let's minimize stress, compression, direct trauma, perfusion, metabolic derangement. And remember like stretch is not like pulling someone's arm off under traction or their femur under traction. Stretch can 
can be as simple as if someone goes out of their normal alignment and let's say a very muscular person who's already sort of flexed at the axis of their elbow that now becomes relaxed with muscle relaxants and anesthesia and they haven't had their arms truly 180 degrees in 10 years. So those nerves aren't used to being extended at the elbow as far as they are. And that could be your stretch injury. It's nothing drastic or traumatic in, its, in what you would expect it to be, but it's enough to cause injury. And that's that you only need 5% of the resting length to cause a stretch injury. Compression can be something as simple as an IV pole, which is up against someone's arm on the side of the operating room table. That's it. It's causing compression. Maybe it's the surgeon leaning on the arm for hours during a back surgery. That could be all that that's that's necessary to cause a nerve injury. Direct trauma is probably more obvious, right? You could think of blood force trauma, penetrating trauma, so that's pretty simple. Perfusion. We think about perfusion all the time. We think about mean arterial pressures and maintaining adequate perfusion to the brain, to the, to the kidneys, and to the heart. But let's also remember too that in vascular path patients, we're more worried about perfusion everywhere. They've got perfusion issues. They've got flow issues. They've got flow limitations maybe in their vascular beds. And that not only affects, let's say, their carotids and let's say their coronaries, but it also affects the smaller arteries going to their nerves too, possibly. They're going to be more at risk for developing nerve injuries. Metabolic derangement is going to be probably the sicker patients, the ICU patients, the people that have acidotic states or any other type of abnormalities from renal disease, renal failure, liver disease. So what do I do in the OR? Well, it's simple. Ask the patient what they're most comfortable with. If you've got a patient who kind of starts to hit upon some of the risk factors here, uh, you should ask them. Say, hey, look, we're going to get you comfortable in the in the bed. I wouldn't give Versed fentanyl right away because, again, you're going to give Versed and fentanyl and then ask them, hey, what's most comfortable for you positioning wise? They're going to be like, I feel great. You know, I'm assuming they're not taking fentanyl every day. They're going to say, well, I feel good, actually. Like, great. I, you know, I'm more comfortable than I've ever been. So maybe you wait on giving that if you're able to and you position them in the stretcher and say, look, this is the bed. And this is obviously if you're not turning prone, you're not going to pr prone someone and then into debate them. So again, you know, in a lot of cases, we can do this in the supine position, maybe not necessarily the lateral, but if it's a supine, even lithotomy position, there's no reason why you can't have their legs go up in the stirrups ahead of time and, and ask them, is this okay? Are you okay? Are you, oh, you're not comfortable. What can we do differently so that you are comfortable? Oh, you have problems with your leg going past 90 degrees at the flexion at the hip and your uh, femur. Okay, well, tell us what we can get away with. What's reasonable for you? Oh, your shoulders are always fall asleep if they're over you know abducted oh great that's great to know oh you've had shoulder problems you had shoulder surgery well what's your normal range of motion all right we're going to try to stay within that range of motion and then as you position them and a lot of times these people are going to tell you it's always about their necks and stuff, which is super important for anesthesia you get them comfortable you know and then you get them padded you, if someone's very kyphotic you have to pad them even more on their back and then their heads and stuff but you get them to that position of comfort and you say are you comfortable we want to make sure you're comfortable for sleep and if they say they are you document it and then you go off to sleep and stuff so it's important that you ask the patients very specific to them this is they're going to be the ones that are going to know what's probably going to be okay and what's probably not going to work for the case if you do everything right, I think one of the things that you're going to see in the literature, you can still have nerve injuries. And I want to just kind of get that out there so we can kind of get that uh, clarified that you can do everything right and still have a nerve injury. So there are going to be factors that contribute to nerve injuries. So who's at risk and based on who's at risk, as you just with the nausea scales, if you have a lot of risk factors, you should probably go above and beyond to actually address these concerns. You should always obviously do the best you can for positioning and stuff, but you should go above and beyond for these patients and stuff. So, you know, not only does it include padding, but, you know, again, making sure you have adequate perfusion, going back to those, you know, five general categories and stuff, really make sure you have adequate perfusion during
during the whole, the whole case. Really make sure you know what the patient's tolerances are for where their legs, their arms, their head is, and their overall, like what's their neutral, what's their neutral position. And then, you know, talking to the surgeons about minimizing how long these cases go, because again, risk factors from the patient on one side, but on the other side are sort of risk factors that we have some control over. And so balancing the two sides to minimize them crossing over and contributing in a synergistic way to risk factors is going to go a long, a long ways. So surgery length greater than four hours is the typical entry point into like being at increased risk for nerve injuries. And then as far as body habitus goes, body habitus is a pretty big one. So being obese and then being in a BMI of less than 22, if you want to look for numbers. And then uh, patients that are muscular, although that's not an extreme, muscular patients are going to be at a higher risk as well because again, if they're in a more of a flex position, they're going to have higher risk of stretch injury when you relax them with muscle relaxants or even volatile anesthetics. Test questions are always going to ask you what's the great, which nerve is the greatest risk at injury. So ulnar would be the first one, then brachial plexus. And if you keep that in the back of your head, just always be looking at those body parts and stuff when you're positioning, knowing that that's where you're you're most likely going to injure someone if you don't properly position them. And there's a, there's you know there's two probably moving parts here. You've got the patient on the bed, and then you've got their arms on the arm boards, which can either set too low or too high, you know, as far as in position to where their actual, let's say where their uh, humerus head fits into the shoulder, or you have the patient's arms to abduct it um, up towards their heads like Superman uh, as well. And then the arms themselves can be over flexed or over extended, right? You know, bicep curls and tricep extensions. So there's so many different moving parts in there. Typically, in most cases, unless you're talking lithotomy position, the legs are just straight on the bed, right? In line with the whole spine and stuff, mostly straight on the bed. You obviously do risk people's like lordosis getting a little bit more flat and because of the relaxation, muscle relaxants and so on, you know, there's ways you can get around some of that, give a little relief under the legs with a pillow but not underneath the knee joints keep the heels off the bed but in as far as test questions go they'll usually ask you what's the most risk and then based on those things you're going to say okay well how do we know they had those injuries and stuff and as you start to talk about actual nerve injuries you should be able to assess for you know, where they where you're going to find those where are they going to be symptomatic and what kind of symptoms to look for SSCP monitoring is a really good early warning system that can say like, hey, the right arm is having some conduction abnormalities, so you need to reposition it. Or in the case of neurosurgery, it's surgeon, hey, whatever you're doing, I'm losing signals uh, this leg, for instance, usually they do a lot of lumbar surgeries, but you could have upper surgery as well. But hey, let's let's pretend it's all like lower legs. You know, you're in the lumbar spine operating and you're starting to lose signals on like the left foot. So it gives you an idea that, hey, we got to back up for a second, figure out what's going on here. So when you are going to position, let's say you go in the prone position, you've got two options. The person can be laying flat on their face on the bed. They have to be prone, right? Prone's prone. But where their arms are is sort of subject. It's not sure. There's an, uh, there's can be options depending on who you're operating with. You can either have the arms at their sides like a soldier, or you can have their arms, you know, facing kind of like, up uh, above their heads, uh, Superman being obviously like totally, as I just hit my uh, lamp here in the room, the Superman can be totally up over the heads, like they're flying through space. Um, but more more than likely, it's kind of uh, up in the air uh, where their uh, elbows are in the same line as their shoulders, 90 degrees at the uh, armpit, and then the uh, the wrists are about 90 degrees up. So you're sort of making like a goalpost on a football stadium. And that's the more typical position. Anything with your shoulders becoming uh, more abducted upwards is, uh, is at higher risk of developing a brachial plexus injury. So this picture gives you some of the terminology associated with the, the movement or the access points on the up, upper arms, for instance. So when you're talking in relation to the shoulder, you're, that's your access now. So anything that's now behind this person, and I'll put my little my clicker on here. So here's your access, it's your shoulder. If the shoulder goes back, the shoulder's being extended. If it goes forward, it's being uh, flexed. Um, so here we go, this is now going forward. Flex is here, this arm is extended. 
There's other access points as far as uh, transverse, sagittal, longitudinal, the shoulder moves in so many different directions. Uh, just look at a patient and see where their, their tone's at when you're talking to them. Are they a little hunched forward? Are they really pulled back with their shoulders? Kind of get an idea of what's comfortable for them and talk to them, but look at them as well. But when you look at these patients and your positioning, you should be assessing not only for like where in space that their arms are, but also where their shoulder is. Is it too far back and not support it? Or is it being crunched forward too much? You can watch this video on positioning by Barish. Barish also has a lot of uh, extra material that can be helpful. So when we do talk about these nerves, and you're trying to isolate what nerve may have been injured during a case, you might have to go and do a post-op assessment on these patients. They could either be in the PACU presenting with some type of neuropathy immediately or myalgia, or this could be 24, 30 hours you know, later, and they're presenting with these you know, vague symptoms and stuff. And it could be a multitude of causes, but the first thing you need to establish is what exactly is bothering them. So you're gonna look at it from two perspectives. And in this slide here, we're looking at it from a sensory perspective. So we're, what's their sensory deficits? So basically where on their arm or hand, in the case of the upper extremities, are they having problems? And then the next step is to test muscles. So you gotta then understand the, the muscle anatomy and what nerves innervate what muscles, have an idea of where they might have a decrease in muscle strength or tone. Um, but in this case, these are the, the dermatones for sensory and stuff. And so it gives you an idea that, you know, for instance, if your pinky is numb, that's your ulnar nerve. And that's how I would assess this. So we'll kind of go through this quickly here. You can read these slides. These kind of associate some of the general muscle and uh, sensory associations with each of the nerves in the upper arm that come. These are all the terminations of the brachial plexus. And so you can kind of have an idea of oh, if you've had a cheat sheet for this when you're going to assess a patient to know what might have been injured uh, during the case. When you think of dorsal, the way to remember what dorsal means when you talk about spatial, I guess the spatial uh, layout of like the human body, dorsal is like the fin of a dolphin and the fin of the dolphin's on their back technically. And so that kind of gives you the idea of the back side. And as far as radial and median nerve goes, they do share some dorsal aspect of the sensory input to the radial um, to the three to three and a half fingers uh, on the on the back side of the hand, and if you go back on that slide, you'll kind of see that. So more specifically, here we'll talk about brachial plexo plexopathies and ulnar neuropathies. So as far as brachial, again, these are all your nerves that eventually terminate into those five uh, distal nerves of the um, the arm for the most part. There's some others that are more proximal, but the brachial plexus, uh, plexopathies are common. They're the second most common after ulnar. Uh, the patient could be doing anything from a sternotomy where the sternum's being retracted and it's pushing the rib cage underneath the clavicle to, you know, these brachial, uh, the brachial um, plexus runs from the neck, travels uh, kind of underneath your shoulder sort of area, underneath your clavicle and then goes underneath into your axilla and then out through your arm. So anything along the way, whether it's your moral head being pushed or turned or overextended in and out of that space can cause it, the rib cage being pulled and pushed underneath the clavicle and causing pressure in the soft tissue there where the nerve plexus is from you know the sternal retractions, a lot of different things can cause this. Uh, if, you, if you turn your head right now, let's say like right now demonstrate on yourself what's most comfortable. If you turn your head to the left and then you try and, if you turn your head to the left and then you try and raise your left arm, so left head turn, left arm, is that comfortable? And you're gonna say, no, it's not. You've got a lot of tension right now on the left, right side of your neck because you're turning left, you raise your left arm. It's really uncomfortable. But if you kept your head left and you lowered your arm, your left arm, you're a little bit more comfortable. And now let's be even more comfortable. Keep your head turning far to the left and raise your right arm. Is that a little bit more comfortable? And the answer should be 
typically yes like you're able to turn your head to the left and lift your right arm up and that relieves some tension on the brachial plexus leaving your neck and going to your right arm you're sort of bringing the plexus towards your neck which is going away from your arm where it kind of terminates so there can be issues even when you position the neck so the easiest thing is usually just keep everyone's neck midline and don't raise your arms up or your let's say your humerus up over 90 degrees from your shoulder joint and that will hopefully help prevent brachial plexus injuries but it's not always the case i mean you have neck surgeries and dissections where you have to turn the person's neck all the way over so the surgeon has a really good view and access to whatever they're dissecting in those cases you know if you can you want to maybe get that right arm up if they're looking far to the left but again that might not be the case because the patient you know that arm's in the way of the surgeon and stuff but there's just ways to think about it shoulder braces can also cause it so if you had a shoulder brace and that was all that was holding that patient on the bed and then you tip that bed so the head of the bed is all the way down in a steep train to Allenberg, and those shoulder braces are holding the patient from falling out of the bed those could obviously cause a lot of compression if you're pushing down on the trapezius muscle right here right next to neck and there's no bone really there to resist and hold the body from falling out well you're transferring all that pressure through the brachial plexus so you've got to so first of all you should just avoid using shoulder braces and use these crazily effective non-stick pads they're like foam pads they're less than an inch and literally as long as it's skin onto these pads and pads onto the bed patient doesn't move i it scares me every time we put these people in steep trend downward position, but it actually does work. You test it before you start surgery, make sure they're actually not moving, but it does work. But the old, the old ways that we used to do things was the shoulder pads. In some cases, you're still going to see that at whatever facilities you're at. Shoulder pads are reusable, so it's cost effective. So you got to be careful in where you position the shoulder pads. And the key in positioning the shoulder pads is going to be to position them um, on the where the joint of where the uh, the clavicle and the uh, shoulder meet. Uh, that's the that's the key. It's called the acromioclavicular joint, and that's where you want to make sure you place your pads for these patients before you test them. Then put them in the steep trend lumbar position. So all the neuropathies are a concern. So this is more isolated towards one specific nerve. Uh, concern right i mean think about where the ulnar nerve travels it transverses along the uh, medial aspect of the elbow uh, elbow so the postcondylar groove for the elbow uh, it sort of is like a little canyon there that it kind of has to go up and over and so it kind of exposes the ulnar nerve on your elbow it's your funny bone and that kind of exposes it to being injured obviously and then it travels along the medial side of your arm so anytime that that arm is on something hard and it's not resting on something soft and it's transmitting a lot of pressure directly where the nerve is underneath the bone there you can have an injury it's pretty pretty common some of the things you have to take consideration is they may not always present no matter what these injuries are whether it's on or brachial they might not present right away and i said that earlier in another slide it could take 24 32 hours before you actually present with symptoms and stuff so ulnar is probably the most common injury and just something for you to know too if it's just sensory involvement with a lot of these nerve injuries they have a they have a much higher likelihood of recovering than if it's also involving their the motor side of their nerves so here's a good picture of where that ulnar nerve is running and it's showing the medial epicondyle process here but it's showing you basically the general area where the the ulnar nerve is running and where to avoid putting excessive amounts of pressure on this uh, axis right here at the elbow again you know direct pressure is always a problem right we talked about that as some of the uh, categories but don't forget also as the elbow over flexes here it's pivoting on this bone here and it's actually causing tension it'd be like putting a rubber band around one finger if you're making like a little rubber band gun out of your fingers and stuff and you can see the tension as you wrap that around your thumb to your pointer finger and stuff it creates quite a bit of tension it's the same thing here at the elbow So let's talk about medium neuropathies and radio. Just remember where on the arm you have an injury from that point forward or that point distal is where you're going to see the presentation of symptoms, whether they're muscular or they're just sensory and stuff. Um, but remember where the nerve originally branches off the, the main trunks uh, of the brachial plexus um, could be higher up. And a lot of times we're just talking about right now the hand and symptoms in the hand and stuff. But you know, the radial nerve does 
do more than just the hand, for instance, and the same with the median. It does go further up, and there are branches off the muscles of your forearm as well. So just keep that in mind. So median neuropathies. So these are the muscular guys. Their arms are usually flexed a little bit, and you relax them. They go and extend much further than they're normally used to. Normal for us, but not normal for them. You can see the injuries there. I mean, you can also injure the other nerves as well. Any other nerves can be stretching when they go out of alignment with, with, with what their baseline is and stuff. Uh, they're not the best nerves to injure the median. Uh, another thing with the median nerve, median, median cubital, right? Your AC. When you have new people putting in IVs in the AC, they risk actually injuring this nerve directly. It sits between your median cubital and your basilic uh, vein. Your basilic vein is actually on the inner side of your arm. Uh, so it's near that kind of epicondial process, the medial epicondial process, but obviously sitting anterior to it and stuff. So you just have a small little area between those two. So if you really just drew a, a line down the midline of your forearm of your, of, you know, your AC here, everything from that line medial to you is somewhere in there is that median nerve. Uh, so you got to be really careful putting in IVs and not going too deep with them and really knowing that, you know, look, for most people, those veins aren't that deep. You know, they're not as shallow as, say, your hand veins, but they're not that deep. And if you don't really see a vein, don't just blindly stick for, for a venous access. Get an ultrasound out. Get someone else with more experience out to help you. If you have median neuropathy, so one way on the on tests that you're going to get questions is assessing the patients when there's actually muscle involvement or there's palsies. So the easiest thing to differentiate between a median nerve injury and an ulnar nerve injury, again, you could go back to sensory and dermatones like that first picture and start there. You know, if you're going to have a, a palsy in the motor side of things, you're most likely going to have sensory involvement, and it's probably a lot easier to figure out the sensory side of things. And you can always have more than one nerve injury, but typically, unless there's some massive trauma, uh, positioning problems usually only present with having a problem with one specific nerve, which is good. We want to minimize this. But anyways, if you're trying to differentiate between the median and the ulnar, just ask the patient to say, I want you to make a fist. And then I want you to show me a high five. If they can make a fist and they can extend their fingers out all the way as a high five, they don't have a median nerve injury and they don't have an ulnar nerve injury. If when they ask them to go and say, hey, can you make a fist? And they're unable to make a fist and bring all their hand, fingers closed, including they're not able to bring their middle finger, pointer finger, and thumb finger closed, as you see in this hand of benediction, they have a median nerve injury. If you ask the same patient, to say, show me a high five, and they go to show you a high five, and their pinky finger and their ring finger stay closed, they have an ulnar injury. When it comes to radial neuropathies, these are these can be typically associated with blood pressure cuffs being too tight, uh, IV pulls up against the humeral side of your <coughs> arm. Uh, these also are associated with some other funny names. Uh, they can be known as crutch palsies. If uh, you have a crutch too tight in your axilla area, you can actually injure the radial nerve. That's going to be a high. Uh, that's a very proximal nerve injury. So you're going to see, you know, a lot of symptoms throughout the arm. You can have what's known as a honeymoon palsy. So if your loved one is in, let's say, you're cuddling with your loved one at night on your honeymoon, and they're in your arms, and they fall asleep on your arms, that can actually cause a palsy, especially if you had a night of drinking, you're, you're not as in tune to your sensory uh, nerves telling you that your arm's asleep. You can have what's known as a Saturday night palsy, where if you fall asleep kind of drunk and hunched over on the side of a chair and your arm's over the top of the chair, that's like kind of like a crutch, and that can also cause a, a palsy. In the operating rooms, where we're going to see, and then obviously trauma. If you break the more distal end of your uh, humerus, that's very well known to cause radial uh, nerve injuries right there. But in the operating room, excessive cuff cycling, like we said, uh, if you have a tourniquet on for too long on the upper arm, and if you tuck the sheets too tightly, and you can see how some people really tuck those sheets up and over the arm and then underneath the patient with their body weight to hold those arms in when they're tucked in for whatever type of procedure. So you can see uh, radial uh, nerve injuries or palsies from that. Nerve obsessive physically, 
Um, we go back to that with the radio. The obsessive physically is basically they get a wrist drop. That's the palsy is a wrist drop. So you have them put both their arms out and you just assess for where their tone is. And you're going to notice one of the hands that's actually injured is in more of a uh, drop or droopy kind of position than the other. And they're not going to be able to bring it back up to neutral. Here are some of the examples of the sheets being tucked too closely. I'll get my pointer out here. Sheets are tucked maybe too tightly, and it's probably somewhere along the humoral, uh, humorous side of the arm where the radial nerve is. And you see right here, here's the radial nerve crossing on the uh, lateral side of the uh, upper arm. So you could have that from a tourniquet, from a blood pressure cuff. You can also have injuries to the ulnar nerve too from a blood pressure cuff. And that's usually because the cuff goes too distally. It's not actually where it's supposed to be positioned properly. And so you can see how ulnar nerve can also be a problem. That's why, you know, uh, like we try and assess questions like, you know, the most likely answer for injury to a nerve with a blood pressure cuff, you're going to say radial. But again, it could be ulnar, but the most likely one's radial. You know, nothing's set in stone. You're always going to have risk factors and lots of different things can cause a nerve. You could have a pull that's up against your elbow causing an ulnar injury, but most likely it's going to hit your radial nerve if it pulls up against your arm. But it does, it, what really matters is just kind of recognizing what can cause these injuries and knowing how to assess for them and then working your way backwards and say, wow, that's, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, this case in particular, they had like three people People. They had the medical student, the resident, and the other resident all up in the arms that were sort of abducted up, and they're in the arm area, and they're all leaning in there to try and get a view. And yeah, that's what contributed to it. So in this picture, one of the things that we see here as well is that the median nerve is not only sitting in between the basilic vein and the medium cubital vein, but it's also sitting right on top of the uh, artery, the brachial artery. So you run the risk of having a patient uh, receive a nerve injury and an artery injury and a hematoma development, which then, you know, after you've removed the needle and maybe you haven't damaged the nerve directly, the hematoma itself could comp uh, cause a compression injury to the nerve. Pretty straightforward, but this tourniquet is obviously not tight, but if the tourniquet was left on and forgotten during the case, or if the tourniquet was left on and too tight for too long without giving a patient a break while you're trying to get IV access, you could cause a nerve injury to the radio nerve. So the most common injuries in intraoperatively in the lower extremities is either going to be an operator neuropathy or a lateral cutaneous. You can obviously have other nerve injuries in addition to this. We do cover a couple of them in this lecture and stuff, but these are two of the, two of the most common. So the operator nerve is, is what actually allows your hip to adduct. So adduction would be bringing your two legs closer together, squeezing your thighs together. However, when you excessively abduct and raise the leg away from being near the other leg or, uh, you know, flexing it outwards like you're doing, uh, let's say the butt of the breaststroke and stuff. Uh, if you excessively abduct it, you can cause an injury. So uh, you can see that this could be uh, possible in a lot of the positioning that we do when you're in the, um, the OB department with the legs being up in stirrups and out slightly to, develop, to give room for the surgeon to get in the middle of like, let's say a female's legs or even in urology, you know, whether it's male or female. Retraction during abdominal surgeries can actually cause pressure on these nerves because you got to remember if you look on this chart here with the highlighter here that you know these nerves are, are branches off of the lumbar plexus here and so you could have excessive retraction that causes direct pressure onto that area just like if you had excessive pressure on the brachial plexus coming from your neck on the soft tissue from the neck before it transverses under the clavicle you could have injuries anywhere near there it could be shoulder braces on the trapezius muscle pushing down at the brachial plexus so again you could have that from retraction of abdominal surgeries or from forceps being used during vaginal deliveries down here, you know, you could potentially be causing direct injury from the forceps here. So just remember, it's not always going to be with your legs being put out of alignment. It could be direct compression injuries as well. Lateral femoral cutaneous, it only has sensory innervation. There's no muscle innervation. But if you do damage this, this one can be a very, very debilitating, painful injury uh, from whatever the reason is. Uh, so again, this is on the lateral side of your thigh. So this is on the opposite side of where the obturator nerve is. And the reason that this can be injured is prolonged flexion. So hip flexion being at the hip is you bring your knees. If you're laying flat on the ground, you bring your knees up 90 degrees 
degrees where your thigh is 90 degrees to your torso and stuff. If you go past the 90 degrees and like crunch your legs all the way towards your chest, that could cause a lateral femoral cutaneous neuropathy. All right, peroneal neuropathy is another big problem with positioning the OR. Peroneal nerve, the comparoneal nerve comes out around, probably around the top of the head of the fibula, as you can see right here. This is your fibula, let me get my marker out. So this, <laughs> this is your fibular head right here. Uh, it's very commonly injured when the fibular head is fractured. So if you ever see that, you're, you might have a nerve injury. It's so high up, you're gonna involve both the, the two branches, which is the uh, deep branch, the superficial branch of the um, peroneal nerve. And you're gonna see, one of the most common things you're gonna see is uh, foot drop, but anyways, the branches also cover other things too than just foot, foot drop too. So you can't invert your foot, you can't extend your toes, you have difficulty walking, obviously. Uh, so that's something to think about. But one of the things you have to also think about is you have a circle right here in green is that these candy cane things can actually get right near the head of the fibula and cause pressure directly on the fibula and cause nerve injury. Uh, so that's something to think about too. So I mentioned the comparoneal goes into two branches. It's the deep and the superficial. So let's look at the next slide to see what the superficial and deep look like. Okay, so you have the superficial. So at right below the, the head of the fibula is where you have that branch. One branch goes deep into the leg and that's the deep part. And that actually has some muscle innervation. It has a very limited amount of sensory, which is right here between, and I don't know why this picture doesn't show it, but you're gonna have a little bit of sensory between the toes right here. So you have a little bit of sensory kind of like right there from the, from the deep um, peroneal. So the other branch is the superficial. And the superficial here covers other aspects of the foot, which we'll see later on and stuff. And so superficial branches, there's two like main roots that branch at the ankle and stuff and cover just uh, sensory dermatones only. Uh, the deep one is what covers the muscular and motor, but also has a little bit of sensory between the big toe and the little toe. Very low. Oh, actually, here's your cutaneous distribution right here. Uh, so actually I missed it. So there, it is actually on the other side because the other side shows the deep. It shows the deep transversing through the deep part of the leg, sort of between like the fibula, tibia, I guess, over the tibia, whatever you want to call it. And that goes, those branches are going to the muscles, obviously. And there's a little cutaneous distribution there. So superficial peroneal is sensory only. And then deep peroneal is sensory and motor. Thoracic outlet obstruction can occur during any of the cases. Again, this is in concern to the pocket between the clavicle and the first rib where you have a subclavian vein or subclavian vein, uh, innominate artery, and the brachial plexus is all transversing. So a small little area can be compressed um, from positioning. It can also be compressed from abnormal anatomy on patients, which you probably wouldn't know. But for the patients in the operating rooms, these things can occur from over abduction, abduction of the shoulder, um, the neck being put too far forward. We're putting direct pressure on the clavicle because you didn't position a shoulder pad in the proper place. Uh, when you have injury or you have thoracic outlet obstruction, there's three categories of it. And basically it all comes down to is which part of these vessels or these different uh, structures going through that space is being compressed. So you can have uh, symptoms related to the brachial plexus being compressed, the artery, the vein. Predominantly, more than 96% or so of cases are going to involve the brachial plexus. In general, this is not in the OR, but in general, if you're a primary care physician. Uh, then after that, the next most common would be about, I think about 4% of uh, the veins are affected and causing these um, thoracic outlet obstructions. And the last one, which is the least likely is about 1% is your artery. And the, hopefully those numbers will equal out to be about 100%. But basically your number one culprit for the symptoms related to thoracic outlet obstruction are gonna be related to the brachial plexus. In the OR, you won't be able to assess for these things if they're anesthetized. You won't know exactly which part of the, uh, which one of these three are actually contributing to symptoms. But your concerns are nevertheless gonna be the same, which is you're gonna have patients that could uh, be at risk for having clots or uh, ischemia to the nerves directly or clots and ischemia to the distal arms from lack of blood flow or congestion from venous outflow obstructions. 
I actually had a patient like this once in the OR where we had proned a patient who was very skinny and young. So skinny being a risk factor and then being prone again in this situation seems to be where it occurs the most. Uh, can occur obviously in the lateral position as well from uh, the patient being on their shoulder and not having axillary support and the shoulder being pushed into the clavicle, being pushed into this small outlet area. But this patient was skinny, uh, very skinny, uh, going prone for a back surgery and I put in a 16 gauge for this is gonna be a long procedure and want to have a nice large line for blood resuscitation and the IV went in under ultrasound uh, in the uh, I think probably in the AC area uh, so wasn't really running great after I put it in and I was uh, probably most likely concerned that you know was it in I checked under ultrasound did a bubble test it was definitely in uh, agitation test and then you know, I said, well, maybe it's because of the arm positioning and stuff. So I was checking around the AC because, you know, it's not the best place to put in IVs if they're going to be with their arms, you know, abducted forward. And, you know, honestly, nothing really changed when you pull a little pressure on the IV to try and get it to run. Nothing really changed. It was running, but it was slow. You know, so you, you try to have everything you can and the, the girl's arms were positioned perfectly. She wasn't over abducted, not past 90 degrees. Her arms looked comfortable. About five minutes into the case, we ended up finding out from the, the neuromonitoring team that they were losing signals on that exact arm. And so, you know, put two and two together, what ended up happening was, is that her actual shoulder, uh, the actual shoulder itself was uh, resting too far interior and out of alignment um, compared to where it should be a little bit further back and more neutral. And that shoulder being kind of rolling forward, hunching forward, and didn't appear that way, but for her it was enough, was causing enough compression in that um, outlet area over her ribs and clavicle to cause an actual occlusion to her venous supply, and, and, and probably uh, as well to the brachial plexus, which they were monitoring. But I got to see, you know, she had a pulse ox on, which was totally fine, but I got to see the venous compression and the neuromonitoring got to see the brachial plexus um, neuropathy as her, you know, injury or compression as a result and so we both got to say wow that's pretty amazing and as soon as we put a roll underneath the shoulder and lifted up that shoulder the the 16 gauge flowed like a trauma line so patients typically before they go to sleep for whatever reason will cross their legs I mean, it might just be sort of like a privacy thing where they just feel more comfortable with their legs crossed or arms sort of crossed or just you know guarding themselves they're in a very unknown strange environment um, crossing the legs before going to sleep is a no-no so when you look at these patients you want to double check if they did cross their legs just tell them uncross your legs and if they go to sleep double check afterwards that they make sure they uncross their legs you can cross your legs before you go to sleep but you know you'll most likely move them as you, you know, after you fall asleep but patients are anesthetized they're not going to move their legs. Um, when you cross your legs, you run the risk of a sterile and superficial peroneal injury. Uh, so understanding the dermatones will tell you which side of the leg, which leg will be sterile, which leg will be superficial. Uh, so you should know for the test if you see like legs cross, you'll have an idea of, based on the picture, you'll have an idea of which leg is going to have the sterile injury and which leg is going to have the superficial peroneal injury. So here is an example of over under. So this patient's right leg is sitting on top of the patient's uh, left leg. As a result, the patient's right leg is going to be the is going to have the uh, sural injury, and the patient's left age left leg is going to have the superficial peroneal injury. So. Basically, if you get a patient in the PACU that has injuries, report it myalgias or palsies and stuff like that, you'll you'll treat it in the in the in term right now with narcotics. Um, you know, long term you might consider neurotin for the neurogenic pain associated with it. Physical therapy is going to need to be contacted for any motor deficits for real palsies, and you just need to document eventually on EMG what kind of injury that they actually have. And so this is not going to happen in the PACU, and really all you're going to worry about is analgesic that can follow up. When you think of physiology and positioning, what you should really be thinking about is how does the positioning affect pretty much these five things. Um, so, you know, Frank Starling's law is your stretch, right? It's preload. If you have preload, you stretch the heart, the heart contracts stronger, right? To clear that extra volume of blood in it and move it forward to never have backflow, never have any stasis in blood. Now, you know, lung mechanics can change too. I mean, you know, if you're if you're prone with a large stomach laying on your face and, you're, and, and that's a large stomach, how does your diaphragm move uh, out of the way in order to make room for lung volume and to, you know, in, in inhalation? 
uh, physiology of respiration could change uh, with position positioning as well. When you think of VQ mismatching, if you're in the lateral position uh, for, let's say, one lung even, and you have one lung down, one lung up, and now there's a disconnect between the lung that's up and the lung that's down, there's going to be, um, you know, less... Um, possibility of the lungs to be able to expand and the down lung, the dependent lung and the, uh, the non-dependent lung is completely shut off. And so, you know, not only the positioning contributing to it, but also the types of surgeries in these positions can exacerbate these problems. So hydrostatic pressure is one thing that just came to mind is, you know, your patient is in this steep Trendelenburg position and now you're going to start to develop a lot of facial and uh, vocal cord edema, you're there for hours at a time because your head and your neck is below the heart in a steep trinomer position. So there's hydrostatic pressures as being a problem now. We give people muscle relaxants. Muscle relaxants help facilitate surgeries, keep patients from moving, facilitate intubation, give you the best operating and maybe anesthetic conditions possible when you're starting a case or even during a case. But there's residual effects to this and stuff, which is you can have an abnormal shape to your diaphragm afterwards. Um, so, you know, these things can all kind of get in the way of adequate ventilation possibly or just in general, um, you know, developing a little bit of atelectasis because of the muscle relaxation and the abnormal shape of the diaphragm. You know, and you can help them uh, ameliorate these with positive pressure ventilation. Obviously, uh, a little bit of PEEP might help as well. But now you add PEEP and now you ask yourself, how does that affect the ventilation perfusion matching and VQ mismatching is now on one of the five causes of hypoxemia over here to the right. But you're adding too much ventilation, not enough perfusion then in different areas of the lungs when you think of west lung, zones of the lungs. So it gets a little more complicated, but again, these are sort of how these all relate. Um, typically, your inhalation agents will reduce tidal volumes and your body compensates by breathing more rapidly. Um, you might have a change in compliance and how easily you can ventilate these people with positive pressure ventilation because they're in a steep trend downward position or because they're in the lateral position with retractors on or you have retractors in the stomach pushing up on the diaphragm and stuff. So again, these can all cause uh, impairments to your normal ventilation of the patient. When you position patients, the endotracheal tubes can move. So typically, I think nose goes where your hose goes. So if you have someone who's overly flexed forward, the tube can go too deep, nose towards your your carina here, uh, and so the tube can actually go too deep. More often than not, goes to the right side, based on its the degree angle of the right. Uh, runoff from the trachea. It's just a little easier to go straight in that way. It's not as steep of an angle. Nose, if it goes too far back away from your lungs and you extend your head, that can actually pull the tube out or herniate it where the cup is sort of out of the vocal cords, but you're still getting some end tidal, but you're not getting your tidal volumes. That's a problem that we've seen a lot. Um, and it can be challenging. You want to pull the tube and reintubate, but don't, you know, double check where your tube is placed, re DL them at the bedside, go in with a fiber optic and look. And a lot of times you can just push that tube in deeper. Uh, the other thing is, is, well, let's say the head stays where it, where it is, but you've you shift the patient from supine position to sitting. That's pretty extreme, right? The, you know, the, the, the head and everything is technically kind of in the same position, but everything sort of shifts more caudal when you sit, go to sitting position. If you go in the steep Trendelenburg, everything's going to go more cephalad. So that too could cause just some, the most minutia of changes where the tube could get uh, main stem where it goes into the right side or the left, but most likely right, or it gets pulled out slightly and you get a air leak. So pressure alopecia is just your occiput's bony, and if you have someone rest their hair, their head against something uh, directly on that bony prominence of the occiput, you can have alopecia. It's from the pressure and lack of blood flow to the hair follicles. It's non-reversible, so it'll be bald for the rest of your life. So that's a really big deal and a huge liability. So that's why you see in most ORs they actually have foam donuts that they put people's heads on, so that the whole head, which is pretty heavy is supported everywhere but the occiput and so it helps evenly distribute the pressure of the head um back pain can be problems you know you, someone most people have lordosis you know some curvature that's lordotic in nature in their lumbar spine and then when you anesthetize them and give them muscle relaxants that can fly in out and then stretch them out of their normal alignment and cause back pain from that um, compartment syndrome is another big one uh, compartment syndrome happen and, and there's multiple compartments in your upper arms lower legs that compartment syndrome can occur um, it's 
it's not easy to diagnose, obviously, if you're anesthetized, but afterwards, one of the thin ways to know, uh, not only from symptoms, but it's just from measuring the actual pressures in the compartment with a needle and uh, uh, with a needle using a manometer. Um, so you might not see this during a case where you're trying to avoid it. You know, the most likely reasons to develop commerce and you're almost always traumatic related and you know ortho trauma is always going to be looking for these things but they can also happen from low blood flow states in ischemia that then leads to um, compartment syndrome so it could develop during a case or it could be something that's a risk before going in that then develops during a case either way uh, if it's not noticed in the or in the uh, pack you will you have to assess for this if you get called and usually what you're going to see is someone's going to have excessive amounts of pain that's just not what you would expect for whatever type of surgery they had or maybe it's on a part of their body that you weren't operating on you know a multi-trauma patient comes in you're fixing a hip but their thigh develops compartment syndrome from positioning let's say or ischemia from positioning just in general was already at risk for it and now now they have it their leg is just excessively in pain and so it's something you should now assess for and call for a consult you know and, and it's a surgical consult i mean the surgical consult they're going to come with a needle like an 18 gauge put it in measure it and stuff and look for you know if, they, if it's at risk for compartment syndrome and that's somewhat specific but not always they may take them back and open them even if the number is not that high but again it's your job to sort of recognize that this is not just positioning and then you know go away that this is a developing acute emergency in a patient and just like with anything when we talk about pressures in the compartment and stuff we're talking about we're talking about pressures that are 10 to 30 rising to within about 10 to 30 millimeters of mercury of the diastolic pressure so you know what does this mean from the anesthetic perspective? Well, again, this is why we really try and maintain adequate mean arterial pressures during cases. Not only because we're trying to protect the um, coronary arteries or the cerebral arteries as well. As this pressure gets higher and higher to the diastolic pressure is when you're gonna to start to see the symptoms. They usually occur in about 30 minutes, about two hours after you bring them, after the initial insult or the point of reaching these pressures, whatever magical number that might be. Um, the final pathway, no matter what, you know, happens in trauma or, you know, low blood flow states and stuff is that there's basically anoxia at the tissue level, which causes the ischemia. And this, any type of blood flow compromise is really what's, you know, what leads to this and stuff. So, you know, we talked about that to the diastolic, but you can also say that, you know, basically the capillary blood flow in general, no matter where it is, it's compromised when your tissue pressures. So interstitial edema comes within about 25 to 30 millimeters of the map and stuff. So it's the same thing when you think in the epinarium of like the, the best of the, you know, nerve supplies where the blood supply is and so on. That's again, now same thing. I mean, 25 to 30 and stuff. And just to clarify, like doing sending off labs really won't be that specific to this. So you might have allocated CKs, maybe you don't and stuff. But you know, really what it's gonna come down to is risk for it, um, feeling the area, the pain, the symptoms that might be hard, and then you know, the surgical consult might come and that resident might put a needle and measure the, the uh, pressures. And even yet when they have a the talk to the surgeon and stuff, they may just say, you know what, let's just go back. Maybe the pressure is not where we think it maybe the pressure is not reflecting how serious it is and we're gonna just go go back and do a fasciotomy. So next on our list of intraoperative complications from positioning um, that we have to consider about or as a result of positioning that we don't have direct control over like we have to be prone no matter what and now we just have to deal with these risk factors because we're prone for instance um, so first one for eyes this is this chart is all in eyes uh, corneal abrasions are the most common like if anything goes around the eyes corneal abrasions like it's either because you didn't tape the eyes all the way closed the tape actually touched the eyes you didn't tape the eyes and you went to intubate the patient and you like brushed up against them your badge is hanging from your neck and hit them in the eyes and their eyes weren't taped uh, the patient wakes up and the first thing they do, they itch their nose, they touch their eyes. They could cause their abrasions, but you're going to get ultimately blamed for it because, you know, they didn't know better. They were anesthetized. They were, they were emerging from anesthesia. So corneal abrasions happen. They Pretty much you go out there, they say their eyes are blurry and you say, what are we going to do? And you're going to say, well, you know, let's document it. It's a, it is obviously an event that occurred during your, your care uh, that's usually going to be reportable. Uh, you're going to have these transient symptoms that usually get better within a couple months. You might give them antibiotic ointment and stuff. You might get a consult to have the eye docs come and look at them and stuff. Uh, very irritating. It's fairly unfortunate. Um, the next thing is super, super bad. This is uh, 
known as POVL, so it's post-operative visual loss, so people go blind. Uh, there's no way to come back from this. So uh, people who are at risk, you should think very wisely about um, doing everything you can to mitigate these risks. So we have all the associated factors of POVL off to the right. So I had mentioned, and it should be in here, is number three is the prone position. So I'll throw my little highlighter on. So here it's like you have to do a, back, a, a really big multi-level back case. There's nothing you can do, a suboccipital you know, cranial. There's nothing you can do. They're prone in this case, right? So you know that you, you have a high risk for POVL. So you're going to do everything you can if you do you have no choice of being prone to avoid the risk factors that are going to cause uh, POVL so what I, what I mean by that is don't let their hematocrits drop too low you know large GBLs mean less hemoglobin which means less oxygen delivery and also let's step, take a step back and say you know what's what's the deal with the optic nerve the optic nerve is served by two arteries it's the central retinal arteries and posterior to the ciliary arteries they're both end arteries with no anastomosis. That's it. That's all you're getting. The highway ends there. So there's not a lot of you know extra you know circulation from other places and stuff. So they're very, very sensitive to pressure in the eyes. They're very sensitive to low blood flow states and stuff, low pressure states. So don't let your blood don't let don't let someone bleed out three liters before you think about giving someone blood. Don't wait till they're 21 and start calling for blood. Be prepared. Stay on top of these things. Don't let your maps sit in the 60s. Run your maps higher. Maybe run your maps at 80. Again, this is just link. This is just a little, you know, bedside talk that we're having. Go based on your protocols. Go based on whoever you're working with. But again, maintain those maps. Give people fluid but not too much fluid because now again you want to maintain mats but if you give too much fluid you can cause interstitial edema on these patients faces what if their head's slightly down so in a lot of prone cases you actually ask the surgeon if you can tilt the bed with the head up slightly so the whole body is actually in what's known as a reverse turn over position to help with venous drainage check their necks are there is there pressure on their jugular veins causing neck distension, which is then increasing uh, pressure in the outflow of aqueous humor from the eyes, which then causes pressure in the in the eyes, which then prevents blood flow going to it. So there's a lot of like things that you can think of. You have like real no control over some of the risk factors the patients have. You just have to know that like, hey, patient has hypertension, diabetes, and the rubber disease, you know, on the smoke major factors, major risk. You got to have a conversation at timeout and say, look, this patient's at higher risk for POVL. Can we have a little reverse T-Berg? Can we minimize the time closing this patient with like, you know, medical students? Uh, can, we, can we replete blood maybe at crit of 28 and not 21? Um, so those are just some ways to think about it. Your intraocular pressure is usually 10 to 20, and the way to calculate that is basically it's your MAP minus your intraocular pressure. As your intraocular pressure grows because of interstitial edema, too much fluid, you know, just the duration of the case is really long, you know, it appears as greater than five hours, you can assume that that number starts to go up. If you start to notice like a lot of scleral edema and or chemosis being developed, you can assume that those numbers have gone up quite significantly. So what is chemosis? Chemosis is the bulging sclera. Uh, so you can see here this bulging is very noticeable. What you do from here sort of depends on your facility rules and stuff. But at a certain point, you know, especially when we were first doing robotic for radical oral prostatectomies, they'd be down for eight hours, had a bed down. So we start to develop protocols that within like three and a half, four hours, you, you stop the robotic surgery and you sit the patients up. There's really nothing else you can do. You can try and mitigate the risk with maintaining higher maps, being careful, being somewhere uvulimic probably with your fluid administration. There's not a lot of blood loss in those procedures for the radical prostatectomies, but again all these things and at a certain point you just got to sit them up uh, there there are some people out there who will pre-treat or treat after they see chemosis with two different eye drops so you can give timol and you can also give uh, carbonic anhydrase which is known as diamox which can also help with the intraocular pressures okay venous air embolisms are rare but are mostly rare except in some cases with sitting craniotomies but again we don't know we don't necessarily looking all the time we don't always have a transesophageal um, probe in or have precordial doppler going but if they were to happen it's an emergency during the case so this slide is very important for any of the cases that you're in anytime a part of the body which is being open and venous 
the Venus plexus, or, you know, the Venus sinuses, sorry, are being exposed, a large Venus area, surface area is exposed, and it's above the heart, this can happen. So it doesn't matter if you're in the lateral position and the right shoulder's up, let's say you're doing a lateral shoulder repair, you're in a sitting position for a shoulder and the shoulder's above the heart, you're working on the neck and that's above the heart. Even if you're in a slight reverse Chernobyl position and you're working on the neck, you theoretically could expose the person to a venous air embolism. Even if you're doing something on the back, if that spinal cord or where you're working is above the heart, again, venous air embolism. So this can happen in a multitude of cases and a multitude of positions. And basically you get so much air in your heart that your heart doesn't push. In the worst case scenario, your heart stops stops with forward flow and you have a cavitation of air in that right side of your heart and you can die. You can go into cardiac arrest. Or you have a paradoxical embolism because about 25 to 30% of people actually have P in uh, foramen ovales and then the air, even if it's not a lot of air, and you don't see any changes on your hemodynamic monitoring, the air actually goes from the right atrium into the left atrium, and then guess where? It goes right up your carotid arteries to your brain, and you have embolisms in your brain, and you have a, a lack of blood flow and oxygenation to parts of your brain causing ischemia, and now you have a stroke patient afterwards. You'll have no idea until you can't wake them up. So these are just, these, it's just a scary risk. And I think the pain frame and ovale is a really crazy thing to know that you could have 25% of people with it. Now, typically, when you see someone has a PFO on the chart, you're like, okay, let's let's get the micron filters, let's be really careful with their bubbles and stuff. But if you don't see that on that chart, I find people get too complacent. They're they're not priming their lines properly. They're not checking all those little ports and stuff and pulling the air out and stuff. Oh, a couple CCs here, a couple CCs there. I mean, how many CCs of air does it take? to cause localized ischemia at the cellular level in the brain on someone who now we know might actually have a PFO. It's not on their chart. They've never had an echo. We have no clue. We assume one out of four have it. And now they've got little microembolisms there in their brain. How much does that take? And you know, a lot of times the brain's so resilient and is so able to kind of, you know, cover and hide any deficits at younger ages, you know, maybe not so much as you get older, you start to see these things, this atrophy, you know, in, in slow onset dementia sort of present itself a lot more. They're not able to kind of cover for themselves, but you might not necessarily know, but you can assume that there's really like even the littlest amount of air is probably not good when you're thinking of how small the microcirculation and blood flow is at the cellular level in the brain. So what I'm trying to say is you should be really careful really, really careful with not having air in any of your lines, regardless if you know they have a PFO or not. Okay, off on a tangent, back to this venous air embolism. So in this case, we're talking large volumes of air. How much is necessary to go into cardiac arrest? People don't know necessarily, but some case studies have shown maybe like around 200 to 300 milliliters. It sort of is like irrelevant because if you've gotten to the point where like someone's heart stops forward flow, you've failed at recognizing early that you had a problem, a clinical problem and clinical deterioration that was from venous air embolism. So this should be always in your mindset early so that when you're saying, ah, you know, ah, look at this, it's kind of crazy to, you know, the, the ETCO2 just dropped suddenly. Why it drops suddenly? And you check the blood pressure and at first the blood pressure is normal. It's like, well, that's weird. CO2 went down. The blood pressure didn't go down. A lot of times CO2 is a surrogate, right? A lot of blood flow, a lot of oxygen use results in the byproduct of CO2. So CO2 is going to go up. And if the, the blood pressure goes down, then the CO2 sort of is a surrogate goes, goes down too. But if it doesn't in the, in the initial beginning, you just see a drop in CO2 that's you can't put a, you can't pinpoint at all and you didn't change the ventilation you didn't change your minute ventilation at all on the ventilator this is when you should the hair on the back of your neck should go up and you should start thinking well okay could this be a venous air embolism you start to think what are the risk factors wow we're we're doing a a crany or we're doing something in the sitting position right the sitting position being the highest risk uh, so yeah this could be that and stuff and if you see that precipitous drop you got to say something right away and stuff you can uh there's other ways to assess for this. The gold standard is really just having a TEN. If you know this patient's at such high risk and this is the type of surgery where you're at extreme risk, and I think, you know, extreme uh, risk would probably be is the craniotomies in the sitting position. It's usually the suboccipital craniotomies. They may prophylactically put a TE probe in and have a central line in at all times to be ready uh, to be able to first see it in real time, air coming in, and then to 
pull the air out if too much gets in there because you can technically pull the air out. So anyways, that's kind of like the best practice and stuff. Um, you can do precordial Doppler. Um, so you can have a Doppler rod. You can be listening for a mill, a mill wheel murmur. If you do decide to use a Doppler and it's continuous, you want to find a way to kind of tape it. It's going to be to the right of the sternum is where you where you're going to place the um, the Doppler, uh, and that's going to probably give you the you know and probably gonna give you the that sound the earlier than if you're going to look for a drop in the end tidal CO2. It might it might not, you know, and that's also on the right side. And that's between like the uh, third and the sixth uh, intercostal space. But anyways, one of the things you'll, you'll see in a lot of the research and studies is that you know. Nothing is ever like one way or another. You know, it's not like it will only be bad enough, and then you'll or you'll see drop in entire CO2 before it gets bad enough. You could get it could be a you could have a drop or change in hemodynamics, but the entire CO2 didn't drop precipitously, right? So don't always assume one comes before the other. But again, you know, if you start to see some of these symptoms and stuff, some of these signs, be thinking about this and stuff. Um, so true. So I guess basically what I was trying to say is case studies aren't always one the drop in CO2 before the drop in hemodynamics and stuff. When we go back to talking about the suboccipital cranies, just remember that you can have three out of four patients all have venous air embolisms with these procedures in the sitting position. Three out of four. So we know that it's most likely happening. The question is, is when does it become a clinical problem? And I can't really answer when you say, you know, one out of four of these patients also have a PFO. I mean, it seems to me like any amount of venous air embolism is probably not good. But if you look at it from just a hemodynamic standpoint, you know, out of the 70% or out of all these patients, only about 3% are going to have like significant hemodynamic changes that are going to probably result in you calling for overhead help for anesthesia or and or possibly leading to coding. Whichever one is worse, it might not go to the coding part, but it's bad. Bad maybe where you have to put a central line in or you have to, you know, suction out air or just bad enough that you have to like have the, the surgeon. And this is again, what's the treatment? As soon as you recognize it or if it's hemodynamically unstable, you should flood the field with water because if you flood the field with water, the air can't be sucked in with that gradient and pressures from atmosphere to what's where your heart is and cause that sort of suction. So then the water kind of stops it right away. Um, and, and then if that doesn't work as well, then obviously, you know, lay the patient flat, possibly put them in the left lateral position, try and free the air that's inside the heart. And then as well as maybe aspirate out the air. If the air goes past the right atrium and assuming let's, let's just hope they don't have a BFO. It, you can fix the pump problem with the right ventricle. You can get the air out, either aspirating or if the air goes forward and stuff. And then if it gets into the actual pulmonary artery system, the air will eventually dissipate and be worked itself out and stuff, which will be a lot safer. Um, so those are some of the things to think about. Human rights supports basically vasopressors, vasoactive medications and stuff to support the patient. You may have to come down on your anesthetic and stuff, have everyone stop what they're doing. Uh, the lateral position sometimes frees it up and gets that out. And then putting the patient head to bed down sometimes helps as well. So here's an example of a precipitous drop in the end tidal uh, capnography. So sometimes in the uh, when you're watching the uh, trending of the capnography, the trends that we use are sometimes not like doesn't show you a, truly a trend, I guess. Um, it's just, you know, the top picture is basically what you're looking at. But uh, what you can do is you can adjust the speed of which it shows you the kind of capnography. And that actually in the bottom of this picture right here is actually a lot easier to see where your real trends are. And, you know, it's like watching hemodynamics on the, on the epic screen. You can see train cracks, right? You can see that like, oh, <laughs> you should have noticed your blood pressure is dropping 110, 198. And then all of a sudden you, the alarms are in your 70 and you're like, oh, I didn't set my alarms tighter, but anyways, you look up and you're like, oh, 70, I got to treat that. And you look back at your chart and your chart actually showed that you were going towards 70 anyways, and you just weren't paying attention. So that's why I think sometimes if you adjust your monitors to be able to do this picture, that's sometimes really helpful when you're doing cases, like especially sub occipital cranies, where you can actually monitor for this uh, drop in, in tidal CO2. 
So spinal cord injury. So look, this is spinal cord injury from positioning. That's what I'm basically talking about. You have, uh, you know, you want to maintain whatever the level of comfort is for the patient. So wherever their head rests at their most comfortable, because they have cervical radiculopathies, they have rheumatoid arthritis and it's affecting their neck or just stiff arthritis, or they're very kyphotic, whatever it is, find out their comfortable neck position and leave it there. Leave it there for intubation, leave it there for the duration of the case if you're able to. And what does that normally mean? Well, it normally means it's going to be not easy to intubate these patients and or mask them because the position they're most comfortable in a lot of these older patients and some disease patients is terrible for you, great for them. So you're going to need to be, you need to be prepared for a difficult intubation, difficult mass ventilation. You might not necessarily need to go the route of the fiber optic, but every case is different. But maybe you just glide scope these patients or use a video laryngoscope and choose that pathway of least resistance, right? Make it as easy as possible on you and for the patient so you're doing the least amount of neck manipulation that can worsen their symptoms and stuff or cause problems. Um, so this picture is cool, cool, I guess not cool. This picture is interesting in that, like if you just look at the anatomy of the, of the head, uh, is that basically when you extend the head, you're really just kind of like pivoting on that C1, C2 and that atlas, I guess, and, and that doesn't actually really cause the stretching of the spinal cord but when you flex forward over here when you actually flex forward that actually stretches the um, cord so if you actually measure these lines from point a to point b point a to point b and this is assuming this head's really i know it doesn't look that extended we're assuming this is really extended and we're assuming this one's really flex you'll actually see that the picture b in the flex position is is now longer and so the over flexion is more of a risk for nerve problems than overextension. How much, I, look, there's no way to measure this stuff, but if you have a patient who's prone, one of the things I'll usually tell people that I learned that I was taught to me is, you know, what you should try and do is, is try and maintain neutrality, right? Or whatever neutrality is for the patient. But you can do that as a more objective measure is take your three fingers and say, can you fit those in between their chin and sternum? Yes or no. Can you fit those on the backside if they're overextended? Can you get three fingers between the big bony prominence in the back of your head and the bony prominence of your cervical spine, which is C7? You should be able to fit three fingers back there so that you're not overextended. Now let's split hands. Pairs. Let's say which one would be the better of the two. I would assume based on this picture, just my opinion, that maybe you'd want to be a little bit more extended than you want to be overly flexed. And that's sort of my thought on it. Because also when you're over flexed too, what's going on with compression on your jugulars? Or even if you're over flexed, what about compression pushing down towards your thoracic outlet as well? So I think on the air side of caution, a slight degree towards extension versus a slight degree of flex might be might be better uh, here we've talked about the the point two and three point one is gravity can be your enemy you can be your enemy your equipment can be your enemy uh, this mask could easily as you're trying to mask bag and talk and everyone's talking to you, you're learning your student your resident whatever you are um, you don't realize that your mask is now actually oxygenating in their eyeballs and now you've given a corneal abrasion um, you know that gentleman's eye protection falls into the patient's face. So that's why I like to tape the eyes right away. I know a lot of times, you know, when you're training, you're gonna be like, okay, can you mass ventilate? Can you mass ventilate? And you're like feeling pressure and rush and the patient's not gonna, they're gonna desat right away. Well, if you pre oxygen they're probably not. Just tape the eyes, tape the eyes. But I understand in the learning environment, you're gonna be like, check if you can mass ventilate. And everyone's gonna have different opinions now. Like, you know, with Roccaronium Sugamidex now, like, you know, to the, you know what's the weight of mass ventilating versus maybe the muscle relax and just give them they're gonna actually make it easier to mass ventilate and if it doesn't you have sugamidex to reverse someone right away so that if they can't well you can get it back so anyways you're gonna kind of fight this battle but all i can say is and the reality is is that you know you're gonna probably gonna have more you're going to probably have corneal abrasions more often you're going to have people that you can't mask when they can't intubate and you have to do a crike on them at the bedside i mean i think you're going to come across a lot more injuries from those things than from the alternative which you know obviously could lead to death you're not going to die from a corneal abrasion but you know being realistic here so gravity can be your enemy so when you're anesthetized and you didn't tie down the arms and they fall off the bed brachial plexus injury right there, maybe median nerve injury too. Just remember gravity is an issue. It could be stuff falling off of you, stuff falling under the patient. Uh, we had in, in the operating room one day, actually in the uh, IR, 
yeah, in IR one day we actually had um, the the light when they're doing some type of tube in IR and we're anesthetized. Terrible place to be off the floor. It's always a risk. Well, anyways, risk unknown. Uh, the entire light contraption popped off the ceiling or one of the protective covers fell off and hit the patient directly. Like who would have ever thought you'd have an injury from that and stuff. And I think that they ended up being fine, hit their main torso and stuff. But like imagine like the ceiling falling out. Uh, in the middle of the case and hitting the patient like you're gonna have to assess that patient afterwards for injuries nerve injuries you know like traumatic injuries lacerations abrusions whatever it is like it's you just never know what you're gonna come across in your every day is just a new day and some are exciting in ways you never would ever want to you never would anticipate and ever want all right supine pretty straightforward when you're supine be mindful of the arms so don't have the arms go too far abduct it so going past 90 this is 90 degrees right here 90 degrees and i can draw that this is 90 degrees don't ever have the arms go past 90 degrees so that's past 90 degrees this would be greater than 90 degrees here um, if you have a patient fall asleep, make sure that their legs aren't crossed. Uh, when you have a patient fall asleep here, I don't know if you really wanna have the arm across the body as well. It's better to have that arm down at their side if you can't have the arm out because they're operating you know, right here. Uh, so have the arm at side with the thumb facing up or the arms, the hands slightly facing down. Basically, if you lay in bed, find out. If you totally like put your thumb out laterally, it's uncomfortable. If you bring your thumb like in the soldier position with the thumb facing forward, it's not that uncomfortable. It's kind of comfortable. And if you have your arm relaxed at your side with maybe your knuckles facing forward, it's not too uncomfortable either. So just think about these things. You know, the other thing too is, is just not to forget as we delete this, uh, just don't forget either that like, where's the shoulder support? So like here, the shoulder seems to be in a neutral position. You know, obviously the patient's a normal body habit, so I'm not worried. But what if the person's back was a little bit kyphotic like this? What if there was a little bit, oop, I'm doing the opposite, I'm doing lordosis. What if it's a little bit more kyphotic here? And what if the kyphosis causes the head to be like somewhere up here? And this is some of your elderly patients. Well, you're gonna have to pad this entire area here, right? A lot of padding in their back, a lot of padding on their head. But now their shoulder, which is green, is right here. Shoulders here. And if you don't support the shoulder, the shoulder is gonna sag backwards. And that can actually cause brachial plexus injury. So you just have to treat every, have a general idea of what's reasonable, and then also have an idea of how to be able to treat the patient um, who has an abnormal anatomy to begin with and stuff. This is the brachial plexus I talked about. The only thing to point out here is uh, thoracic outlet syndrome goes underneath the clavicle and above the first rib. And so through here too, you're gonna have, uh, coming up through here, you're gonna have your uh, innominate artery or subclavian artery and your subclavian vein, depending on which side it is. Innominate artery is actually on the right side. This looks like the left side of the patient, but basically you're gonna have a large artery or a large vein that comes out of there and goes down along with the brachial plexus uh, down um, past the, um, the humoral head right here. So again, this could be where it puts pressure directly onto it and then goes into the axilla. If you put an axillary roll in a patient in the lateral position, you don't want the axillary roll actually in the axilla, as you see here, I'm losing my cursor, as you see right here, is because there's tons of nerves there and there's really nothing for it to go up against. You want the axillary roll somewhere down here, distal to the actual axilla uh, to put pressure on that rib cage and avoid the vascular structures that are coming through here because you still have the arteries that are coming through here and you still have the veins that are going back. Prone can be a little scary. You're turning a patient who's probably been intubated in the supine position of stretcher onto the operating room table. You have a lot of lines to worry about. You have to worry about the circuit. You have to worry about the patient being extubated. Uh, so just a lot of concerns and stuff. Uh, maybe you turn prone, something happens with the airway. Uh, so when you do prone patients, the stretcher should never be removed from the room until you're totally confident that the patient's safe. They're on back on the monitor, back on the machine. You've re-listened to breath sounds on both sides and then start hooking them back up to the monitors. Should you turn them and take things off and then put them back on? Some people want to keep things on the whole time. Do whatever your facility says is right. But every time you turn a patient, either lateral or prone, you should always recheck for bilateral breath sounds and stuff and make sure your tube is still in. Um, prone is you know, a case for all these different reasons. You can do them for a lot of back surgeries. 
buttocks areas, perirectal areas, and so on. Um, proning patients is a team effort which is being led by the anesthetist. So whoever is in charge of anesthesia, if you're the if you're the anesthetist, you're calling the turning and you're dictating what happens next. You know, a lot of people are going to want to try and rush to start the procedure and get things set up and get the surgeon ready, but until that patient's back on the monitors and, and is safe and being and, and safe and ventilating, you know everyone should be helping you achieve that and stuff. Um, so when you turn prone, you need to be prepared for like how are you going to be able to support the thorax, the hips, and the face. Those are probably the most important things. The goal being too is that however you support this stuff leaves room for the abdomen to be free, free from. Um, from pressure, right? So you don't want someone who's, you know, if they're large, anyone in general, you want them laying on their stomach because that's going to impede the actual downward movement of the um, of the diaphragm. So there's two ways to set that up. One way is then what we see in this picture here is they have um, they have these chest bolsters set up in a longward fashion. One. So it's going to pretty much go uh, on the side of their chest down to like their, you know, relatively their iliac crest right here. It's going to support their weight this way and this way, kind of parallel to each other. You also see they take account for their knees with uh, circular foam or this way it's gel and they give a slight flexion at the knee joint by putting something underneath the tibia to get their feet off the ground and it also provides some uh, preventing rest, uh, sorry, preventing stretch to their lower extremity uh, nerves here. Uh, so you can do it that way. The other way you can do it is you can go directly across the chest, perpendicular to the body, directly across the iliac crest. Either way, that still leaves space for the stomach here this, to be able to move freely. If you have a female patient, you gotta be very careful no matter which way you use these big gel bolsters right here in that you don't want to cause ischemia to the breast tissue. So you want to make sure the breasts are moved out of the way of the bolsters. Prone is also, there's a lot of concerns with how the neck is stabilized. We talked about the fingers below the chin and behind the neck, about three fingers between the mentum and the sternum, three fingers between the occiput and C7. And not only that, you want to make sure the neck's neutral. It should be neutral just because that's the most comfortable thing for the patient and whatever their neutral is. It should also be neutral because, and neutral and or check for anything at the apparatus that you're using to be prone for any pressure on their neck. Like uh, your, jug, your jugular veins have no valves and so you gotta be really careful you don't have any pressure on there and, and prevent blood flow out from the brain and then obviously increasing intracranial pressures. So that's something else to think about and then their face. So depending on what you're using for their face to hold their head in the neutral position, while it's prone is you got to be careful that the nose is not touching the actual table so put your hand underneath their face and touch and see if you can fit your hand on their nose if the nose is touching the table you have to readjust the body and you might not be able just to simply readjust the head up higher because that might overextend them you might have to actually adjust their bolsters up higher and then their head up higher so you got to kind of think what's best for the patient their eyes you should always be able to see their eyes when they're prone. So you should be able to see, and they usually have mirrors at the bottom of these devices so you can just see up their eyes. If you can't see up and you're using whatever type of contraption, you can sometimes pull the contraption or the foam aside and look from each to the left and right side and see that their eyes have no pressure. No foam is on their eyeballs and stuff because again, you don't want to cause any type of pressure on the optic nerve or, in the, or any pressure in the, in the eye itself. Uh, so those are all covered. Prone position, yep. So I think we're pretty good. So just remember in general, prone positions at a higher risk for post operative vision loss. And you go back to that slide that's earlier in the lecture that talked about that more specifically. What do you do with the arms is also another problem with these uh, positioning and these patients and stuff. So again, if this person was prone, we'll just draw this out. You have either a choice of having the arms at their side, like this person is, and keeping them there the whole case and tucking them. So tucking could have problems, maybe the radial nerve with over tucking and so on. Those are all problems, right? You want to make sure that if you do tuck the arms, you should have two IVs. I recommend two IVs because if one gets positional during a case or God forbid it comes out for some reason, um, you got another one as a backup. You don't have to... Uh, you know, there's no way to really get under there and put an IV in. I've done it, but it's really not worth the hassle and stress. And it's always at the most inopportune times. The other thing is, is that, you know, any of the IVs you have there, any of the circuits you hook up to it, cut off any of the extra pieces that clamp it and, you know, unnecessary pieces of plastic you're on there because all those could be pressure points. Whatever is left over you can't remove, put a couple four by fours on it to pad it and then tape it to the patient so that if there's any external pressure from the surgeons operating in the field and stuff, they're not pushing in that hard piece of plastic into their arms and stuff and causing a pressure sore. 
So that's arms talk. Now, if they turn prone, there's another way you can do it. So here's your head. This person's prone. Here's their body. Here's their legs. And now the next thing you got to worry about is their arms. So like, you know, arms could have been parallel, but in this case, arms are going to be no more shoulder and arm at 90 degrees. And so this is the next thing you got to worry about. So you don't want to ever have the arms be 90 degrees. 90 degree would at this joint right here is not good, right? Or more than 90 degree. And then the other area you don't want to go past 90 degrees is right here at the shoulder. So this is the next area. You don't want to go past 90 degrees, which is the shoulder. Again, this is the person's head right here. So you don't want to go past 90 degrees at the shoulder. You don't want to go past 90 degrees at the elbow, right? So you, if you had to maybe pick like a perfect looking patient and stuff, maybe the patient would look like this. Uh, actually, you know what? We'll go like this. Like that. And then this is the person's like body right here. It's a little hard to draw. Head. Head. All right, so there's your head. So right here, shoulders not uh, over abducted past 90 degrees. And right here, the elbow joint, the axis of the elbow, is not over 90 degrees. But it's also not fully extended out because you don't want to stretch it that way either. So this is a pretty reasonably looking patient. You change your uh, your field, and you got to also remember too, if you're looking at this from a side view, and now here's the patient's head, and here's their body in a side view, you want to make sure that their shoulder right here doesn't go too far down and doesn't go too far up as well. Because you can still have injury to the nerves and or compression to the vasculature as well in that area. And if it does look like that or you're seeing signs of it, if you just take some towels and put it underneath the uh, anterior deltoid, you can sometimes give a little bit of lift to that. And that's what one of the neurosurgery chiefs taught me. So here's two examples of being in the prone position. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. Not everyone's going to have the same type of equipment at all the different facilities that you go to. So we'll just kind of some surmise here, these two patients, what's the good and the bad. So uh, patient to the right here, let me just throw on my little pen. Look, the shoulders are over abducted. This is supposed to be 90 degrees. I'll try and draw 90. And instead, we're more like 110, 120 degrees, something more than that. So not good. You can't get through this whole case like this. It just wouldn't be correct. Um, and then on top of it, you know, the person is turning, um, is turning into their their arm and stuff. Uh, but I guess both arms are up. I mean, look, not to overcomplicate things, the arms don't look good. Um, the head is turned to the side, so you might risk some brachial plexus issues on the left side there. Um, because it's facing away, theoretically. I'd be curious about what, what's going on with the eye over here on the left side as well. Does it look like it's taped? Is the nose hitting anything? Um, they're deciding in this case to use bolsters uh, underneath the iliac crest, underneath the chest here, which is fine. That's leaving the abdomen free and clear so that the diaphragm can push caudal and, and not be obstructed. They put rolls underneath the legs to get the legs off. Uh, I wonder if they have anything underneath the knees for pressure points here as well. Um, not bad. Maybe you want to consider a little bit of reverse Trendelenburg with the head up a little bit. Obviously not that much, but a little bit to help uh, facilitate venous drainage and reduce interstitial edema in the brain or in the head, wherever, head, neck, throat. Patient on the left, this is 90 degrees. We use this type of actual device, this prone view pillow. Uh, there's a mirror at the bottom that you can look up. So that's a good, you wanna make sure that the head right here is actually seated into the foam. And in some cases, if people are being flipped, let's say for a lumbar procedure, but they have, an, they have a neck fusion, uh, I've found patients with absolutely no weight actually on their heads. The neck is holding the head off the bed. That is terrible. So again, make sure that the head is actually resting and, and evenly displacing pressure within this foam pillow, this foam contraption. There's the mirror, like I said, you can see the eyes. Um, you can wanna make sure the nose is not touching the mirror down here. Uh, the hands, this is not, oh, this is, you know, this is flex about 90 degrees. I wouldn't go more than 90 here at the disjoint at the elbow and stuff. I wouldn't go more than 90, but that looks pretty reasonable. Uh, patient's legs are up slightly, and I don't think there's anything underneath the knees here. Uh, this one, in this particular type of device, you do have to worry about a lot of heat loss underneath the patient. So sometimes people will put like blankets or type of heat uh, 
air heat device underneath the patient to help keep them warm. And then you'll put another device across their shoulders to keep their upper body warm if it's possible, depending on how many level fusions that they're doing. More great pictures to see people in the prone position and brings up some more questions and some answers I might have for you. So we talked about most of this stuff. Um, people can be put in pins also for cervical, posterior, and neck um, surgeries. So you might see the Mayfield pins for more than just cranies. Uh, putting neck pins in is extremely, extremely stimulating. So you basically go from like not much stimulation, you've you flip the, you're, it's before you flip, obviously. You put the pins in before you flip. The neurosurgeon is doing everything with the head. They're calling the shots when you're, we have pins and they do everything. You're just watching the airway. But anyways, they're supine. You've intubated them. You've put your lines in. You got your A line in. You're ready to go. The next thing is to flip the patient. So before you flip the patient, they put the pins in. So just remember, you go from like not much stimulation, so lots of stimulation, intubation, then you're trying to get organized. You know, A-line doesn't hurt that much when you're anesthetized. So you probably have your anesthetics on the lower side because you're kind of in between, right? Well, you got to remember, as soon as like, okay, you go to anesthesia and you say, don't say I'm good, even though you're good, be like, yeah, one more second. Go and get your meds and be prepared to preemptively treat the patient before those pins get put in because they're so stimulating. Talk to your people at your facility what that might be. Maybe get them deep around the inhalation agent. Maybe give them a bolus of propofol. Give them a bolus of analgesic. Maybe give them a bolus of remifentanil. You know, there's all the different concerns and considerations for each of those things. But you should do something to prepare them for those pins going in. I, I know some people might actually give esmol and stuff. Um, that's another consideration. But you should talk to your, your clinical preceptors and figure out what they think's best. Over here is your... Let's put our little laser on. This is a prone view pillow. This is looking up from the prone view uh, pillow, and that's the prone view pillow. There's the mirror. You would see the reflective image through that. The only thing I want to point out here is that when you get your tube that goes through one of these sides here, it can make quite a big of a turn going up into the patient's mouth. And sometimes the tube ends right here, and it's really hard to get your circuit attached to it. So what you should look for in all these prone cases is for a little mini accordion, a little extension accordion. That's not the big ones, just the small ones, enough to go from here to here. So that when you hook up your the L, or the T piece or whatever you call it for the end, endotracheal circuit or for the circuit really, the anesthesia machine, that you don't have to like wedge it in here and have a hard time hooking it up because you just, it's one less stress. So having that ready is great. Now, again, since it is sort of a tight bend there going from, you know, the patient, it's from pretty much the patient's mouth here and out the side, uh, there's a risk for kinking, especially as that tube gets humidified and warmed up by the patient's, you know, mouth and all the air moving back and forth. Uh, you have know, an HME probably on the circuit. So, you know, there is going to be a risk that tube gets more malleable and the tube could kink theoretically. There's lots of things that can go wrong during these cases with main stemming, the tube coming out, you know, you, you, you're turning the patient that's kind of been in the hospital forever and all that real true manipulation rattles some secretions and they mucus plug. Like there's just so many things that just random things that go wrong. But so there's always, there's so many different ways you should have a lecture on problem solving, like ventilation issues. But the one thing that definitely can happen in prone that I'll talk about is that the tube can actually kink. And you won't know, you'll have increased peak airway pressures, they won't be as compliant, obviously, and you're just not getting your tidal volumes if you're in volume control. And so you're gonna know that something is obviously, is obviously wrong. Sorry for the uh, ringing here. So something is obviously wrong. So, you know, you go through a bunch of different steps, whichever ones you think are most important, you, you, you talk it over with your clinical receptors. But one of those steps is assessing for kink tube. You take a French catheter, a long, long French catheter, and you're basically taking that really long, flimsy French catheter. You gotta make sure if you're in pediatrics, like this kid right here, it's a small enough French catheter to go through the inner diameter of the ET tube. And you're basically gonna take them off the circuit and make sure you can get that catheter all the way down the tube. If you can get it all the way down the tube, you probably don't have a kink. Uh, this solves two problems. One, you figure out if you have a kink or not. And then two, it also tells you if you have secretions that are plugging the tube somewhere, you can hopefully suction those out. You may also be able to do a little saline flush down the tube. It's, it's not easy, but you can try to get a saline flush down the tube. Uh, it's going to be kind of creative to do that. You might have to actually use a French catheter to the saline flush through and then suction out. But anyways, that could be another problem that you're solving with it. But yep, French catheters should always have them. For peds, always have them and always have them for proning patients too. 
there's some more pictures here. I'm quickly looking at this to see what stands out as being abnormal. You know, I don't know if the patient right here, if their arms are a little bit far abducted. I don't think they are. This seems pretty reasonable here. You know, I, I'd say it looks reasonable without being closer to see. Check the eyes maybe with this patient. The top right here is obviously, you know, one of the surgical residents, probably or anesthesia residents, maybe. Um, looks pretty good, actually. Looks pretty reasonable. Um, can't see behind them. I don't know. It looks like they have just towels or blankets are using as bolsters. They seem appropriate. I'd love to see what the neck looks like. The neck it, with these foam pillows can sometimes be a little extended. So sometimes like what happens is you get these big foam blocks. If the bolsters aren't actually high enough, this is disproportionately larger than that and then the head gets to extend it back and um, that happens a lot actually and honestly you know do you really want to make the bolsters underneath the chest higher they'll become a little bit more unstable right you want these high enough to relieve pressure on the abdomen but you don't want them so high that you can use this fancy foam pillow so what i'd probably do is, is customize the pillow keep the bolsters to just one don't start stacking these if you don't have to and then cut down this foam pillow the white separates from the blue or you can just cut the blue uh, instead this below picture these arms are abducted too far forward and actually if you look right here this these, this shoulder looks like it's down too far the shoulder right here looks like it's actually kind of needs a little bit of support so i'd be kind of curious about that and also look at the neck right here look at the neck it's kind of pointing downward i know you can't see the black ink that much but that neck looks like they're really flexed forward so yes you can put the fingers behind the occiput in c7 the fingers under the mentum and the in the sternum but remember that's like if you're pur purely just doing flexing and extending but try right now take your head and stick your head forward like a giraffe you can easily stick your head forward like a giraffe it's really uncomfortable but your chin's not touching your sternum but you're still kind of technically flexing forward right it's not so much the down chin down in the sternum but it's chin facing projecting outwards and that's kind of what this guy looks like that's also not good either so i don't think that the 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 head in this case is positioned well. These bolsters are now perpendicular under this guy. Um, so just being careful, you know, where what they're over, you know, should go over the sternum and stuff like that, over the iliac crest. They look actually pretty, pretty normal. And this lady right here, I'm just wondering with that lady, is is her stomach free? Is this like one big pad and the stomach's not free? She looks pretty skinny, so it's probably not a big deal. But if this was somebody with a really large belly, this probably wouldn't be a good setup right here because again, the belly has nowhere to go. This is just one firm mattress that's underneath their thoracic. Uh, cage and underneath their pelvis. Both these patients are prone. They're positioned slightly in different ways or different equipment, but the thing you're going to see in both is that their arms are tucked. I think tucking the arms, if you do it the right way, is probably eliminating some of the problems from positioning, just strictly from a positioning standpoint, um, probably more than if you had them up and they're slightly abducted upwards in front of them or like a goalpost. <laughs> You know, you do run the risk of the lines in here getting kinked off or there's like little bits of, uh, you know, plastic that's actually on the tubing that gets pressurized in here. The tucking can cause the radial injuries, can also maybe cause other ones too for other nerves. And look, you know, you know, you, I guess that's, we'll leave it at that. Uh, so the only other thing to talk about here that kind of stands out is uh, wires underneath the bed, wires underneath the bed, and the airway exposed underneath the bed, especially with these contraptions. This one's not so much, it looks a little bit more proactive, but this guy's in pins and track in the halo pins, whatever you call it. And look, he's got all this stuff dangling. I always try and hang, and you can see right here, they hang the tubing somehow. I'm trying to see how this is set up, but it looks like the tubing goes in, it goes here, and it looks like they tied it off to this maybe. I would consider doing that, and there's pros and cons, but I would consider doing that just so that if someone's leg caught this or something attached to them caught the tubing that has a different point right here that's like, you could use a tegaderm, tie a tegaderm around your anesthesia circuit and then tie it off to the bed to a part that's going to move with the tube, obviously, not in a, in a uh, independent of it but that might not be a bad idea you gotta clean up all these wires and stuff because you know what's gonna happen is in a lot of these cases this might be in this honestly is maybe a sub occipital crany so this might not be the case but if you're doing a spine back here you're gonna be running in a C arm or a magnet something massive an O arm actually that not a magnet an O arm and you're gonna be you know shooting 
film and you know honestly as they move that thing in and out they they're not going to be able to they're not always paying attention and that actually might pull the wires out or pull your endotracheal tube out all right t-bird t-bird is another position obviously that we do quite often radical prostatectomies and some of the obg or gym stuff might be in t-bird it might even be in steep t-bird so it just means Basically, they put the head of the bed down as far as it can go, and the patient looks like they're going down a slide at the at the park. And it's really crazy. It's just amazing they can even do that. So, you know, first of all, look, you, you got to make sure that whatever apparatus you're going to use to keep that patient from slipping on a bed works. So you do a test run. This person's on a mattress. I think mattresses are great. I don't know how it works, but it works really well. Their option is shoulder. Um, pads but shoulder pads can cause problems you know remember the answer on the test is acro acromioclavicular joint if i said that correctly and that's basically where the clavicle and like the shoulder and like the pretty much the clavicle and the shoulder sort of like meet up um so that process that that joint is basically where you want to put that bolster or that pad is right here not right here on the soft tissue coming from the neck so there are a lot of different changes with the hemodynamics when you start to put people's heads down or put people's heads up so when you start to put people's down the pressure the hydrostatic pressure is going to grow right if you dive deep into the um, ocean there's higher pressures as you go deep versus when you rise up the pressure it goes down so you know, you're going to have this higher pressure hydrostatic pressure below the heart so you're going to have a higher chance of increasing swelling so i've actually had patients that we've we we really need to assess if they're in the steep trendelenburg position for hours and stuff and you look at their face and just take a image of their face before you start and then later on say wow this person's swollen so if their face is swollen they're developing we talked about chemosis right we talked about sclerodema well if all that stuff's there why is their airway not swollen their larynx not swollen maybe they were a difficult intubation so like you've increased the trauma the swelling and now you added more swelling for hydrostatic pressures you gave tons of fluids and there's an interstitial edema from that as well so you've got multifactorial reasons to have edema in the pharyngeal space and in the laryngeal space and you're gonna just what you know with as fast as our drugs work now you're gonna just you know sit them up undock the robot and in 20 minutes exubate them I don't think so. I think you should be really careful and you should not assume that their airway is not swollen and that that too might be stenting the airway open. It's just something to think about. I mean, look, how often does it happen? It's probably not that often. I don't even have numbers for you and stuff. And I can say just anecdotally from my experience, it's not that often, but it does happen. And you should at least cross, you should at least cross these things out and, and at least be thinking about them. And one of the things you can do is you can test for a cuff leak. So like, okay, at the end of the case, tons of airway, like face looks swollen and you think the airway swell well, first of all you can go in and do a fiber optic you know really nothing wrong with that you know let's say you know no risk for bleeding go in through the nasal with a pediatric fiber operoscope and just look at the cords look at the tube in the cords is the is the larynx nothing it looks like mashed potatoes looks like nothing like it did when you intubated i'm assuming maybe you saw it and you're, you're here for the whole case or everyone saw and it was on a you know glide scope and stuff uh, wow mashed potatoes it's like it's got a grip a vice grip on that tube but you're gonna be like okay like all right that's maybe we uh maybe we wait and you can wait you can sit these patients up and like you it's remarkable how much the swelling comes down in 20 minutes when you sit these patients up and the airway swelling goes down so that is an option something else to think about is a cuff leak but a cuff leak is very subjective right is it a cuff leak on 10 centimeters of the APL being closed or 20? Like, what does that really mean? Um, I don't know. Um, that's without obviously seeing what the, lary the laryngeal tissue looks like and stuff. And, you know, obviously that also takes into account too, like what if you have a size eight tube in versus a size seven tube? You know, there's room for that to, you know, maybe have some, you know, if you took a, if it was a seven, maybe there wouldn't be a edema around the tube. Like, I don't know. It's, it's not always the most accurate. Uh, a more objective way to assess for a cuff leak is to simply put them on volume control and then set your tidal volumes at you know whatever you want that's normal within normal tidal volumes based on ideal body weight so 68 cc's for ideal body weight and then to take the cuff down and then see what their tidal volumes are so it's really the return tidal volume so let's say the magic number for this uh, ideal body weight patient is 500 cc's and you drop the cuff what tidal volume are they getting because basically the machines are giving 500 cc's of tidal volume the question is is what's coming back if you have 
the cuff is down now, if the cuff's down, really you shouldn't get that much of the tile volume back because why would all that air go back through the tube when it can go around the tube and least resistance? You think of Pascal's law, least resistance and stuff because you don't have to go through the, the long length of tube. And you know, depending on how big the tube is, and obviously the biggest thing is radius, but how big the radius of the tube is compared to the radius of the trachea, assuming the trachea is much larger than the tube, you didn't put an oversized tube in. There's variables here too. Um, it shouldn't be your full tire volume. So if you get 500, you shouldn't get 500 back. So when the cuff's up, you get 500, you definitely should get within margin error, like, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna make this up right now, like 5%. So w when you drop the cuff and stuff, the key is, is to see how much tire volume comes back. And so if you get less back and that magical number less back, then that's actually a good sign because that's saying that there's a leak around that, that, that tube. So really, I, actually, when I'm looking for the numbers here, like there's no one set standard and the cuff leak test, whether it's audible or it's using objective measures is not totally accurate and always convictive, convincing, I guess, and possibly indicative of having croup or strider afterwards. There's a lot of variables in it, but hey, it's at least something. But I think a number you can shoot for is if you're doing the cuff leak is it's end expiration. So if you're able to drop the cuff after inspiration and on expiration and then assess the difference between inspiration and expiration, it's about 25%. If it's more than 25%, you might have problems and stuff. Again, it's sort of subjective here. All right, moving on. So look, when you're in steep turn Nallenberg, your stomach contents are being pushed towards your uh, you know, chest here. So we could have a risk for aspiration. I always put in gastric tubes before you flip these people's steep T-berg. If it's appropriate and there's no contraindications, uh, people can't breathe like this if your head's down that far. So these people have to be intubated. You're not doing a, artificial airway or natural airway general anesthesia with these people their frc decreases because they're they can't move their diaphragms down and all their abdominal contents are pushing into their lungs so there's like no space to ventilate the lungs so your frc goes down you become less compliant so these are you know these are all risk um everything above the heart is a risk for venous aerobolism so you know if you had that you'd probably have to put a central line in if it came really bad to get the air out talked about the shoulder supports and sheets and so on uh, so moving on. Here is another image of what steep T-bar can look like. This is absolutely steep. So this person's on a sheet, therefore they have to have shoulder rolls. The shoulder rolls are right over the acromioclavicular joint. I'm probably butchering that to be honest. Uh, so just remember that, you know, put that in the right spot, not on the trapezius muscles where the brachial plexus is coming off the neck here. Uh, arms look like they're tucked. One of the things I will say is that the hands down here, whether you're, and this is a lithotomy steep trinonga position, it's not just steep, it's lithotomy as well. So you have all concerns of lithotomy as well. Uh, you don't want to over uh, abduct, so going this way, abduct and over flex, which is the knees coming to the head, these legs. But uh, anyways, if you look at these hands here, they can get stuck in things. You got to be really careful their hands aren't stuck in any of the things. There's a foot there's like a leg table that gets taken off once there's their legs going to the thotomy position, these boots. And that table can, you know, once that comes out or goes back in, you can catch the fingers on here. If you have machines coming in and out, they could catch the fingers on there. So be very mindful of that. And also mindful of obviously their eyes too. When it's robotic, all the robot wires and arms are all over this patient's face. And so I'll usually, we, at our facility, we'll put eye goggles on and we'll put a donut foam roll with the tube going through the middle over their face. And then I'll put my hands through the drapes and tell the surgical team, can you guys just draw in here and say that this is where their face is? So that as they throw their things around the field, they're not tossing heavy equipment right onto their face. Okay, just, you know what, another uh, example of where we would put the, the bolsters or like the shoulder pads are gonna go right here. So this is the proper placement at the acromioclavicular joint. <laughs> Reverse T-berg is just the opposite. So sometimes they'll use people's feet to help hold themselves up. You're gonna have a lot more hemodynamic instability with this because now you're, all of your blood's gonna pool. All the hydrostatic pressure's down here. It's not helping the, the, the heart with um, blood flow preload. The other thing is, so you wanna shift in this position slowly, make sure their body can adjust. People who are beta blocked or ha are on blood pressure medicines might not react as well to this. If their preload uh, is down because they've been NPO for a long time, you might want to bolus fluid before you get into this position. So start your fluid early when they get into the room. One of the other things to remember is if you have a blood pressure cuff right here on the humerus, 
that's reflecting the blood pressure right there in line with the heart. What it's underappreciating is and underestimating is what the actual pressure is in the brain. So if you have a map of 65 here, your map in the brain might not be 65, it might be 55. So you gotta remember that, you know, the, as far as where you put your blood pressure or if it's a transducer, you think, oh, put the transducer A line at the phlebostatic axis right here. No, you know what you're probably more worried about is the brain. So put the, uh, put the transducer at the tragus, which is relatively at the circle of willis of the brain, so that it's actually reflecting what the pressure is at the circle of willis and not at the heart. We know that because of hydrostatic pressure, it's that the pressures down here are gonna be great. It's gonna have no problem going downhill to get blood pressure down here, but it's gonna have a harder time going uphill to get blood pressure here. So I'd rather have the transducer at the head, or I'd rather understand that I'm underestimating the blood pressure with the non-invasive, and I'm gonna run my maps at 75 instead of 65. Beach chair position. So, you know, beach chair position, I don't know what happened to our, our pictures here. Um, let's see if we can get these up. Hmm. Okay, here we go, beach chair position. Well, that's a really nice beach chair. I wish we were all there right now. All right, this is more typical of your beach chair position here. This is, I think we have one more picture. Yep, one more picture. All right, so you're you're sitting up. Um, there's, you know, a couple problems here. You're going to have a majority of your blood is pooled below your heart, and your head's up even higher than the reverse t bar. This is really sitting vertically up. We do these a lot for shoulders. So the patient on the right is actually a shoulder procedure. We do a ton of those. We can do these for subvocipital cranies, but a lot of times it's like shoulder surgeries. So you've you got a couple things to worry about here. So obviously hemodynamic changes, venous air embolisms are the highest in the sitting position. Uh, what are you gonna do with the head? The head is weird and floppy. In this case, they kind of like use some type of gauze to tape it down and stuff. So again, is the neck in a neutral position? Is it not too flexed, not too extended, and not too far forward, too far back? Even if it's not flexed or you know extended, if you can imagine that. Uh, shoulder, uh, the surgical shoulder, they're gonna deal with, obviously. They're gonna do their own thing and stuff. Um, the other shoulder, you do have to worry about how that shoulder sits on an arm board. So you wanna make sure that the shoulder doesn't droop down too much and it's putting a lot of tension on the brachial plexus as if the whole arm is basically unsupported. Even if the forearm's on something, if the majority of the weight is on the shoulder and not resting up in a neutral position, that's not good. So you wanna make sure that the arm board's up high enough that the shoulder doesn't droop. It's got some support to it and stuff. And then you always wanna make sure that you don't have any pressure on the elbow and that, and that non-surgical arm as it's resting in the seated position. So just think of, if you're in a chair right now and you're taking this lecture, and you have the arm boards next to you, what is your forearm resting on? What would be comfortable and what would be uncomfortable? As you supinate and turn and pronate your arm and stuff, just kind of get an idea of what would be comfortable and stuff. Does it feel good when your wrists are hanging off of it with no support? Probably not. And if you had too much, you don't have foam underneath your arm, which you'd always have, and you have too much pressure on your early chronic notch, that could be an ulnar issue, right? So there's some of the things to think about. What's the blood pressure doing? Is the cuff like too, too large for the patient? And now you're kind of cutting down into the um, AC of the patient because it's it's on, you know, it's a little weird. Uh, in these patients as well, you don't have the other arm, so can you get enough access in that one non-surgical arm? That's another consideration to think about. The arm is always gonna be at the anesthesia area, and you'll be able to access it, but with all the changes in hemodynamics, the lack of having another arm and stuff, a blood pressure cuff on that arm, you know, going up every three to five minutes, causing your IV to stop working, you should really consider if this patient needs an arterial line, because they might need an arterial line so that if you do have huge shifts in hemodynamics, you can follow it and you can treat it and you can start them on pressors because I usually always get a phenylephrine drip ready for these patients. Again, if they don't have cardiac problems, phenylephrine drip always ready for these patients and I always try and get at least 500 cc's on board. Now let's think of some other things, but and we'll keep going with that. And then as far as our IV goes, I'll only do one IV, you know, unless I think they're really difficult access and I'm gonna have problems, then I'll actually take my time and try and find another IV. But if I know I have good veins and I'm usually okay with one IV, but it's the blood pressure cuff that I'm concerned with because again, do you, if you are unstable, do you really want that cuff going off every minute? For how long? How long can they tolerate that without a, you know, not getting the drugs from the IV as quickly as you think, B, having nerve issues, compressions, maybe DVTs from getting the cuff cycling too often. So just put an A-line in.
Um, you can put IVs in their legs, depending on the patient. Some patients you can't, there's contraindications, something to talk about in clinical. But again, that's another option too in some cases. Uh, make sure the neck's neutral. Um, one other thing here is, uh, so if you look at the picture to the right here, uh, they eventually get completely draped, which is great, right? Like draped, I usually then hang the drapes on my side up so there's a wall so you don't get splattered. There's lots of irrigation that's used, so that's definitely something they're not doing here. Put the drapes on the other edge of the drapes, put that up on your poles. When the case is over, you drop your drapes, grab your two, watch that those drapes come off. Those drapes, underneath a lot of these drapes, they're sticky, purposely sticky to, to stick to the patient so fluid doesn't go in, to also keep it sterile. But the problem is, is that a lot of the newer people when like the first year residents or interns are setting up these patients, they'll they'll tape the ET tube. They don't realize that. As they're putting the drapes on, they're going quick. The ET tube gets draped. And when they go to pull the drapes off, because you know they're being forced to rush, unfortunately, like, you know, the, the less senior people are always under pressure, which is not fair to them. Uh, they'll pull the ET tube out and not even know it. They'll just, you know, they're doing their thing and then they accidentally pull out your ET tube. It's happened. So be very mindful of that. Uh, the next thing to think about in these sitting positions, especially the shoulder surgeries, we do a lot of regional anesthesia. And regional anesthesia is going to come back to haunt you about the nerves and the, and the distribution of the nerves from muscle and sensory. So like, you really should learn this stuff now for assessing nerve injuries, but you definitely need to know it when you do regional anesthesia because how do you know your block's working if you don't know what nerve you're blocking and how to assess if it's blocked and it's numb, um, or if the motor isn't moving, that's what you're trying to achieve with the block. But anyway, so these patients get a lot of interscaling blocks. So one of the things you have to think about with the interscaling blocks is they have a higher risk from having the interscaling block and having a reaction to it. I'm gonna move to the next slide and it's gonna talk about that. Can you think of right now what that is? What is associated with the sitting position, the interscaling block and sitting these patients up? So if you were able to guess this, congratulations. It's the Bezold Jarish reflex. Uh, you will absolutely be pimped on this question in clinical settings, so definitely learn it. <laughs> so again, it's you know, it's from the inner scaling block, mixed in with probably not having enough preload, mixed in with like sitting the patients up, and they're gonna have this like excessive amount of hypotension and bradycardia. Some people say that you can attenuate this with like a little bit of 5-HT3 inhibition, so giving Zofran and stuff. I mean, I guess it doesn't hurt, give Zofran. I don't know if the literature really supports that anymore. But, you know, be prepared for it. Make sure you get at least 500 cc's on board of fluid if they're able to get that, no cardiac concerns and stuff before you set them up. And just don't just sit them up from, you know, zero degree to 90 degrees right away. Like uh, the surgeon's gonna wanna do that but just go, go slow, go slow, possibly pre-treat with phenylephrine and ephedrine, depending on what their heart rate is and, you know, pre-existing medical conditions, right? Consider pre-treating, staying ahead of it and stuff. Um, if they do become like really, if they really become unstable and their blood pressures drop, they become bradycardic, look, they haven't started surgery. Tell the surgeon we're gonna lay them back down and lay them back down, get some more fluid on board, Plus or minus, you know, if you think, you know, maybe pre-treating with glyco might help with if it's a bradycardic related hypotension or not, I, you know, conversation to have in a clinical setting with your preceptors, but I would definitely consider, you know, sitting, laying them flat and starting all over, pre-treating again with phenylephrine, ephedrine, and then have a phenylephrine drip ready because you know what? We have to maintain their maps higher than what you're seeing at the non-invasive cuff on their arm. They're, you're worried about, you know, perfusion to the uh, cerebral, uh, cerebrum, you know, the brain and the circle willis. So if you do have an A-line in, transduce at the circle willis, which is basically right here on your ear, it's the tragus you're gonna do like somewhere around here and, um, and you know, stay ahead of the curve. If they have vascular disease, cardiac disease, you might have to keep the pressure even higher than that. So those are conversations you have at pre-op, you have it like the pre-check before you start your incision and stuff, so everyone's on the same page. Now look, if you run pressures too high in these cases, there is another concern with shoulder surgery, which is if they drop a scope in there and they're they're trying to flush and, you know, operate through scopes and stuff, this is an open surgery mostly, they can't see a thing. If they start bleeding a lot because their pressure's high, they're gonna just have all these micro 
bleedings everywhere and they can't see anything and they're gonna yell at you. So you have to have a reasonable sort of approach where you, you have a discussion, you tell them what your concerns are and you find a happy meeting with the maps where they have to understand that like, you're not comfortable with putting these people there and risking stroke. But at the same time though, you understand that you can't go overboard with you know pressures in the 140s and maps in the high 90s maybe because you know that's gonna make them sit there forever trying to do the surgery. So there is a give and take in the situation. There's no one magical answer and stuff. You know, the, if any, if there's really any magical answer is that the, every book says you should keep their people's hemodynamics within 20% of their baseline. If they're a bad hypertensive patient, then cancel the case, have them come back another time. Because if 20% of baseline is too much for the surgeon, then they're not optimized. And obviously hitting that in pre-op before even doing the case probably would have been more helpful than putting the person to sleep and risking all the problems with putting people to sleep and anesthetizing them, you know, to have that conversation. So you're probably late to the game. So, so yeah, so these are just some of the things to think about. Um, you know, I think we covered everything else here, so we'll just move on. All right, lithotomy position, we, we've been covering almost all this stuff. So, you know, again, this position can be mixed in with like, you know, reverse or trinomer position and lithotomy or just lithotomy. So candy cane stirrups are a concern. The candy cane of the stirrups goes right on to the lateral portion of the leg by the fibular head. By the fibular head, and we're gonna have actually a slide next coming on this, that's actually where the common peroneal nerve comes out. And so obviously you put pressure on it and you have a nerve injury. That's why these boots are a lot more popular. Uh, no matter what, whether you're in either, either of these contraptions, when you raise the legs, you should try and raise them at the same time and lower them at the same time. That'll prevent injury as well. So this should be a two-person job. Don't try and do it yourself. Some of the residents are like superheroes and they can actually just raise these boots together. They're on sort of like tracks and stuff, you know, but again, you should just do it at the same time. Um, so comperoneal, we'll talk about compartment syndrome is highest in all the positions. That could be a test question in the lithotomy position. So compartment syndrome is the highest. Again, compartments are, they're fascial compartments. They're actually, there's different compartments in your arms and your legs, there's more than one. And so again, it's just one of those compartments and stuff. I don't know where on the legs that you're gonna see the compartment syndrome. So I wish I could answer that question, I can't. Um, you know, sciatic nerve injury is another problem too. So, you know, when you look at these legs and stuff, you have, and I'll get my little mouse out, you have to again, worry about over 30 degrees with the legs going, you know, too far left and, and right. So, you know, the, the right leg going too far to the right, the left leg going too far to the right. And then as far as the thigh goes, knees to chest, right? So if you go past 90 degrees, which would be like, you know, this is past 90 degrees, this person's probably at high grades. If you start going too far this way, you overflex. That also can cause a nerve injury as well. So I put this lecture together over the course of a couple of hours, and I actually realized that I mentioned that the next slide's going to have the branches of the peroneal, but that was actually already covered earlier in the lecture when we covered the peroneal neuropathies and stuff. So if you really want to see what happens with the peroneal nerves, you'll see it. But this that last slide before this one is just covering where that nerve is in relation to some of the equipment that we're using for positioning. All right, lateral decubitus is sort of, there's a lot of stuff in a very small amount of area all around your face. This picture does not give it justice. Usually what happens is when you try and get that non-dependent arm on something, that pole goes in the bed frame right here and it comes up and over and it gets right in your face, right in the way of your endotracheal tube. So look, use, see this person's using the extra inner part of the foam donut. This is that foam donut I was talking about that helps keep your occiput off the bed. In this case, it's keeping, we're just using it for the head. If anything, this is helping alleviate the ears because actually that's something I haven't really mentioned is the ears. Always make sure when someone's lateral, that their ears aren't flipped. Put your hand in there and feel the ears. Just like you put your hand and feel where their nose is and it's not putting pressure on the bed. Feel their ears and they're not flipped over. But anyways, that inner part can come out and you can use that to pad various things. And if you had a pole that was in the middle of the way of your tube right here, you probably wanna like pad it and just be careful because God forbid they coughed and hit their head on there or hit their eye on there or something happened, the surgeon's moving the patient and the patient's head flopped forward. You'd be surprised, prepare for every, possible scenario to happen. So here, I like to actually stand behind the patient and look and see, is the head, neck, and the thoracic spine all in alignment? I like to look for that. Also, the shoulders can droop a lot right here, and you can put compression on your jugular. So check and see how the shoulder is, you know, oh great, the arm's resting on something, but if the shoulders really droop forward, you're probably, you could be putting pressure on your thoracic outlet or just putting pressure on your neck here, which is then putting pressure on your jugular venous return and so on and so on, so another risk. 
Um, you know, how far extended is the head? How far flexed? Use the three finger rule. That's not a bad idea. And the next thing is to think about is, well, okay, so all those look good, but, but the shoulder that's the dependent shoulder down here is putting so much pressure on the actual vas neurovascular bundle that you're having uh, thoracic outflow syndrome and stuff or something's going on along those lines. So in order to alleviate that on the dependent side now is you have to put an axillary roll. And we kind of mentioned this, but the axillary roll, and we'll go to the next slide, is, and so we talked about all this, you know, shoulder shouldn't go that far high up like you're a goal pose you want to keep this still like below this plane right here i guess you call that the frontal plane uh and then the arm right here if you look at the axis of the elbow again now overly flex and overly extend it and all support it and pad it and cushion all right so let's talk about the ex axilla roll all right so the axilla roll <laughs> and you know this one doesn't even have an axilla roll so here we'll talk about this one really quick and i think we'll be stumbling upon the axilla roll in a second so lateral position same thing shoulder is not like like just sunken down right it's it's hard to describe but you'll see what i mean when people are anesthetized and their joints are also loose so and again you ask them too ahead of time what's your normal shoulder like you know movement like how much how much you have, what can you do on a different axis and stuff uh pat it the hands pat the wrist isn't dropping you know pat it again uh, i find this happens a lot you not only pad the arm like this but you have to pad the forearm and the hand up slightly to kind of create that sort of flexion in it. Um, I find a lot of people need this, uh, so be ready. How are you gonna secure these two things, these three things that are all stacked up on each other so they don't fall off in the middle case? Think about that as well. Like These are all these things you gotta think about. Patient looks pretty good, pretty neutral right here. Hopefully their ear is free and clear. Another thing you notice is uh, they put pillows between the legs so that you don't have knee on knee bony prominence issues. And then they're obviously watching the um, ankles and the heels as well. Okay, so axilla rolls. Axilla rolls do not go in the axilla. In the actual armpit, you have the neurovascular bundle, right? So you wanna go distal to that. And you wanna kind of feel where the ribs are below that. That's where your, your axillary roll goes. There's things that they create for axillary rolls. And then as you can see here, there's things, and I, I must have drawn this before, there's things that are also, so that's your axillary roll. They use a blanket. Other times you use a, a one liter bag of saline on an adult, you know, obviously different for kids. So you actually have a nice gel roll that's for the axillary roll, release pressure in the axilla for the actual shoulder to sit comfortably and for no compression on the neurovascular bundle. Axillary rolls are, you know, should all, you should use them. I don't know why you, you wouldn't use them, but you should, you should definitely use them. So if you were to have a hot spot and were to place an axillary roll on this patient, you know, you're going to, you know, I guess this is hard because you can't really see it here, but like, let's just assume that you could see this, all of this on the downside, right? It's a dependent side, you know, this is not where you want to put it. So like, if you had to put a hot spot, you're going to be like, yeah, this, this area, no, that's the, that's the armpit. It's where you put your deodorant, you don't put your axillary roll. So you probably want to put the axillary roll probably like right here. Right, you see the ribs right here. Probably like right here is a better place to put the axillary roll. You're leaving this whole area free and clear, okay? Because that's the neurovascular bundle. Not for this lecture, but again, we can go into details at the alveolar capillary membrane where you have all these different types of hypoxemia occurring and stuff. The five causes right here. Lots to talk about in that. That could be its own lecture, but just be as you progress your learning and stuff, start thinking about what all the positioning can do in terms of what causes hypoxemia and abnormally affect your, your ABG. All right, so hemodynamic and positioning. Um, hemodynamic and positioning, all right. So basically this is just a chart, uh, you know, graph I found, and it just kind of gives you an idea of like, you know, there's only so much preload that helps with Frank Starling's law, as long as you have a viable, really strong, healthy heart that can keep up, obviously. So you get to a certain point where your reference is, this is your normal preload based on your hydration status. And eventually when you get from here to further over on the preload curve, because now you've just displaced the person to steep chernomer position, all the blood f f easily flows back to the heart. Well, you have enormous amount of preload, right? Like your, your, your preload's here, it's high. And if your preload's high, well, your cardiac output, guess what? Cardiac output based on this goes up, right? Cardiac output goes up if preload goes up. But the key thing in this chart, and this is honestly a cardiac lecture, the key thing in this chart is that you do get to a certain curve where it no longer goes up, and if anything, it goes down. And at that point, it pretty much means that your heart just can't keep up with all that preload and stuff. So every heart's different. People who have, you know, 
uh, hearts that aren't like normal, you know, their EFs are not normal, their diastolic dysfunction, there's different variations to this, like, you know, valvular issues, pulmonary hypertension, whatever the reason, the hearts just can't keep up. Um, those are patients that you're going to say, like, look, there is a certain limit to having too much preload. All right, the biggest thing to come from this, this slide, it's visual learning for you. I know it sometimes helps people, but look, compliance is good for lungs. Compliance is good. Compliance, the less pressure you have to send from the ventilator to achieve the same tidal volume means that you're more compliant. Another way to look at this is the more you get for your money with less money, the better you are and stuff, the better bang for your buck. So if I get, if I can to plug in five centimeters of water in a ventilator and get 500 cc's of tidal volume, I'm happy. If it takes 20 centimeters of water to get 500 cc's of tidal volume, it means that I am less compliant. Compliance is good. I want to be compliant. So that's my only take on this slide. The rest of the stuff is just as important, but um, I think more self-explanatory. And this is honestly the last slide. So I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture and thanks for taking your time to spend with me.